Okay, guys, welcome to the CS525. Before I start the class, I have to give you credit for the most of the slides that we're going to use in this class. Most of the class are modified versions of the slides used by the Hector Garcia Molina. So if you find any mistakes, any errors in this, class, uh, this slide, this means you have to blame him, don't blame me, okay? Of course, you need to blame me. Anyway. So this course is what? Is introduction to the design and implementation of the desk-oriented database management system. So what do you mean by the desk-oriented database management system? So you have an assumption that the data is going to be completely stored or the main storage of the data is going to be on the desk. So sometimes when you try to achieve the data or access the data, you are not going to find the data available to the main memory, this means that required from you to perform some disk input auto operation in order to retrieve the data from the desk and to bring it to the main memory in order to perform the or process the data. So again, this is just how to help you to design and implement of the database management system. It's not how to use the database in general or to build this say an application. We cover this one in the CS425. Okay. So let me first introduce myself. My name is Yusuf, and I'm in the fourth year at the IIT. I need to update this one, actually update it, but I'm not sure what happened here. Anyway, uh, this is not the first time teaching this class. I think the first day, uh, time I came here to the IIT, they assigned me to this course. And then after that, it looks like no one interested to teach this course except me. So I got stuck with this course. No, no, I like this course, by the way. This is my email if you wanted to communicate with me, if you want to send any mail. Okay. Uh, my research interest is the data privacy and security, and so I'm related to the database too, and at the same time to the security. This is my office server, or office location. Of course, you are not going to find me there if you being able to go there in person to the IIT. So please just go uh, close to my office and make sure whether my office is still there or not. I didn't see my office since last year. So anyway, the office hour is gonna be mainly conduct view the Blackboard, okay? And this is my office hour. It's gonna be each Fridays from two to three p.m. If this time doesn't work with you, please reach me out. We can figure out another alternative way. If you notice my voice disappeared, uh, yeah, I'm struggling, okay? So this one maybe give you, I mean, enforce me to speak slowly, which I'm not get used to do that. Usually I'm speaking too so fast, so I'm struggling when you keep this class. So feel free to stop me at any time if you cannot understand me or if you cannot follow me, okay? Mainly we're gonna use two different platforms to cover or conduct this class. The first one, we're gonna use the Blackboard, which is gonna find the assignment, mainly the assignment, maybe the coding assignment. In a few minutes, I'm gonna go over them in more details. There's some reading materials. If you notice the Blackboard, you're gonna see that we do have a folder called, under the assignment, it's called reading. And this one it contains to say some book chapters or some PDF files where you're gonna have like extra reading if you are interested to learn more. And the lecture notes are gonna be available in the course blackboard, hopefully in advance before the class. So you're gonna get a chance to take a look to the PDF files or the content of the class before the class. We are going to rely on the Piazza in order to be for the class discussions. Um, if you have any question related to the coding assignment, I encourage you in order to pass this question uh, on Piazza. Me, and hopefully, by the way, hopefully we're going to have a TA this class because um, we are we have three sections of this is five to five. Uh, the section one and two as well, is related to the student here at the IIT. We do have a section three, which is a student of China. Section three, I think we have 19 students, plus add up with a seven plus five student, plus 12. Since we are above 20 students, so the department is going to assign a TA. So the TA is going to be responsible once I get his or her information, contact information. I'm going to share it with you. This is going to 
the TA is going to hold an office hour, weekly office hours, plus it's going to be responsible for helping you during the coding assignment. If you have any questions, uh, so feel free to reach him out first, then CC me at the same time. Okay, so this one is going to be updated. So I need just to make sure that to get the contact information, then after that, I'm going to update this slide later. So definitely we're going to have a TA. Okay, which is good sign, which is good information. So the video course of this course, I expect for you to know at least how to use SQL. You understand what you mean, the SQL, the relational algebra, because I'm not going to teach you that. Although we're going to go over the relational algebra more quick during this class, but definitely I expect for you to know what you mean by the SQL query language in general. Okay, and at least uh, you have an idea about the transaction. If not, we are going to cover the transaction later in more details. I expect from you to have a programming experience using C or C++. And the reason behind that, because in the coding assignments, I'm going to give you like some helper files. All these files are written using the C language. So without these files, it's hard for you to perform the coding assignments. So I expect for you to have some experience working in this programming language. It's easy to work with. It's not hard. If you are familiar with Java, Python, so just you want to go over, uh, maybe spend a few hours or maybe sp spend a few days in order to review the material, then prepare yourself to work with the coding assignment. Okay. As you know, the class is going to be completely uh, conducted virtual. Okay. So there is no need to see my face, and you don't need to see my face. Okay. So anyway, so it's gonna be live class is gonna be live streaming like now. At the same time, we are going to record this class. After the class, give me just a few maybe hours. So maybe by ten or eleven o'clock p.m., the class or the recording gonna be available in the Blackboard, and for the student China, it will be available into the Lumina. I mean, uh, environment, so you can uh, watch the lectures. I encourage you to attend the classes, okay, if you have a time, because attending the class is going to give you an idea, give you the chance in order to talk with me, in order to ask questions, okay? And remember, the semester is too short, it's like six weeks, so we're going to, have to cover a lot of materials, okay? And don't worry about the exam, the only thing I want from you, I'm going to cover some few slides, uh, I'm going to talk about the workload, so I will make sure that I'll ask you what I want from you to focus what you expect from you to do this class. Okay, we do have a short tutorial which is available across Blackboard which allow you in order to help you to how to attend live streaming as long as you're already there here so you know what's going on there. Uh, it's gonna show you how to locate the recording lectures. It's gonna be available under the content uh, lecture recording after right after the class. Uh, the, how can we conduct the office hours. Okay, definitely gonna be this. There is another link next to the live uh, lectures, which is gonna be uh, I'm going to use during the office hours, so it will be available online. And then again, I'm emphasizing, I encourage you to sign up for the Piazza. They have already sent you an email, so you can use this email, use the link, the sign up link, and using the password in order just to uh, enroll in the Piazza or sign up for the Piazza. Lecture is going to be available before the class, so you're going to have a chance in order to take a look at the content of the slides, so you know exactly what the ex kind of expectation, what we're going to cover the next lecture. So we try to cover the same thing in many ways, lectures, exams, and we do have a coding assignment which is going to help us in order to understand what we cover in the class. Uh, we do have short tutorials, a few tutorials we're going to cover the class, we need to try to explain something, go over something, I get it, I'm gonna give you like maybe short tutorial how to can we uh, perform or show you the effect of this command that we cover or the theoretical part that we covered and under the same postgres and so you can perform this one in under any uh, database management system. So what I expect from you? I expect from you to attend the live stream lecture if you can. If you can't, please watch the recording. Don't wait longer. Because, as you mentioned, the semester is too short. So we're going to cover, I mean, too many or too much materials. If we miss one or two classes, I think you're going to have a struggle in order to uh, keep up with us. Okay? Be active and think critically. If there's a question, ask a question, etc. I want to hear your voice or at least your comment. Just type something. You say, 
what do you think if you have questions if you don't like or if you have to say some concerns or maybe someone sometimes they ask a question they expect from you to answer okay so this means please don't watch online movie or whatever just try to focus with me do the programming assignment and please start early and be honest I'm gonna get back to the honest here and of course study for the exams if you didn't get a chance to take a look to the course syllabus, I encourage you to go over that. So at least give you an idea what's going on in the class and give you more details about what we cover actually today's lecture in the first part. Most of them will be available in the syllabus. At least give you an idea what's going on, what's the objective, what the expectation. The most important slide of the first part of today's lecture. The workload and the grading, okay? You're going to notice that there is a schedule of important dates is available in the Blackboard, the Piazza. The Blackboard is going to be in the syllabus. I'm going to add them to the Piazza here. Okay? And there is a, one slide is already there, so we can go over this one in more details. We do have a programming of science, which worth 50% for the overall, I mean, grades. I'm not going to say they are easy. They are also okay, okay? Especially the first and the second. So we are going to cover the theoretical part associated with every single coding assignment. Then after that, I give you like helpful file, files and give you, let's say, description, what I expect from you to do, what the task that you're supposed to do. I'm going to go over the coding assignments in more details. The first coding assignment worth 10% and the second 10% and the third and the fourth, 15% each. Okay, so the total is 50 so it, it looks like you expect that every 10 days we're going to have one coding assignment. It must be you have to finish this one. In total, we do have four assignments. Okay, I expect from you to form groups of three students at most. No more three students can work in one group. Okay, so the group is going to be determined by the Friday, May 28th, midnight. So I'm going to send you a link today, or maybe tomorrow, I guess tomorrow, today. I'm not sure whether you're going to manage to finish this one or not, because I have a lot of things to do. So I'm going to send you the shared Google document, which allows you to in order to starting, uh, I mean, uh, enroll in the groups. You're going to see that group one and one, two, three members, group two, one, two, three members. I don't encourage you to work alone. And I know most of you, maybe you can finish this one by yourself, but remember, it's short semester. You have only 10 days to finish the coding assignment. So don't come to me if you decide to work alone. Don't say, I didn't warn you. You're going to say, okay, I can't do it by myself. Maybe you can't do the first and the second, but the third and the fourth may be required for me to do a lot of work. That means I encourage you to work as a group. I wanted to make sure that the coding assignment is the same one that we used last year and the year before, etc. So maybe you're going to find uh, out on the internet some coding assignment. Someone has already did this coding assignment. I don't cause you to copy this one because we do have all the copies. We're going to match. We're going to uh, match your submission with all the coding assignment submission you already had to have in our data, our database, on our system. And if you find the match, then you end up, you get zero, you're gonna lose A. So please do your own work, okay? I'm going to ask you to fill uh, the pair and the cell evaluation form. What is by doing so, by at, at the, let's say, by every single coding assignment submission, once you fill this form, I can make sure that who worked and who didn't work. If you didn't participate in the coding assignment with the group members, don't expect you're going to get the same grades. Maybe you're going to get zero, because if you do nothing, you're going to get nothing. So just I want to make sure that I encourage you to work, to participate. Okay? We do have a quizzes. We do have two quizzes, actually. And I prefer to have a quizzes. Maybe someone is going to say, oh, too much work. No. The quiz is going to help you a lot because the format, the structure of the quest, quiz is going to be similar to the structure of the midterms. So midterm, actually, we have only one midterm. So that means if you solve or rather uh, say work great, uh, do did a great job with the quizzes, so the midterms exam is going to be similar format to the quiz. And also the final exam is going to be similar format to the or structure to the quizzes at the midterm. Okay, so they're gonna be easy, don't worry, not a lot of work. Actually, for the quiz, maybe spend one hour, one 
hour and a half if you want to type your answer and you're gonna finish this one okay it was five percent the exams is gonna be uh, and the quiz is gonna be open book too okay the exam is gonna be open book open notes okay close the friends for okay not you cannot communicate with your friend during the exam the midterm exam it was 15 percent okay and this is the time of the day that expect is gonna be the midterm exam so I just noticed, by the way, we do have another C. Joshua, I guess you all would be in another class. So now we have two midterms exam at the same time. So just reach me out later. We try to figure out. So at least I'm going to make sure that uh, you didn't have two exams at the same day. Because I'm planning to have the exams with the information security going to be at the same time as this class. It's going to be from 6, I think, from 9, I guess. So we'll see, okay? I need just to make sure. If you cannot make two exams at the same time, please reach me out later. The metro of exam is worth 15%. Okay, if you can't do this, means there's no problem. Uh, the final exam is going to be this day, okay? It's going to be July 1st. Now we have the same thing. Now we have two final exams at the same time. If you can do it, if you change your mind, just reach me out later, okay? And let me know. So anyway, this is the final exam. It's going to be the final day of the class. I give you three hours, does mean that the exam is gonna require for me to do th uh, use the whole three hours. It's easy, it's doable. But I give you enough time to make sure that you're gonna finish the, all the questions. The exam is gonna be easy. As long as you understand the quizzes, the midterms, the structure, I'm gonna, of course, we are going to cover a lot of materials, but I'm not gonna test you in the whole material. So you're gonna see that what kind of a question. I'm gonna give you like a hand to say, this is one kind of question that you expect in this part. I'm not going to ask you to def say define, or let's say in order to, uh, yeah, to memorize anything. The only thing I want from you is to understand, okay? So this is a little great distribution. I modified this one last semester. So now to get A is easy to get A is 80%. Make sure, please, 50% is not the coding assignment. Without the coding, some student, if I do have one class, one student didn't submit the coding assignment. Then in this case, definitely gonna get F. I can't help in this case. You didn't do any coding assignment. I usually do curve at the end of the semester and add extra credit. So it's easy to get A here. But please, make sure you are great, you already did the whole work. Uh, the coding assignments, the quizzes, and the exams, okay? So, what's the programming assignments? We do have four uh, coding assignments. We are going to build them one on the top of the other. other. Let's go over the coding assignment, then I will get back to the slide. The first assignment is going to talk about the storage manager. So, in this case, remember, we try to implement the database management system, or at least some components of the database management system from the scratch. The first thing I need from you, I do have a file and expect from you to store this file into disk. So the way that we're gonna store the file in the disk, we are going to cover this one in the class. I'm gonna give, explain to you how it works. Then I will ask you to do the simple way to do that, or naive way in order to store the data on the disk. The file is gonna be stored as a sequence of a blocks into the desk. So this file into the desk is gonna be something similar to this. So I'm gonna have a block one, block two, and etc. block n. And here we have like a special directory, we're gonna talk about the directory, page directory, which is gonna help me in order to navigate my way to store my data. So this is the way how to perform this case. You have, we are going to build the storage manager, okay? Which, of course, in order to work with this one, it allow me to store the data as the blocks, okay? From, and allow me in order to retrieve the data from the file or from the system. So you can create a new block, store the in the desk, and you can fetch a block to the main memory, okay? The second one, after you build this one, now we're gonna use whatever you built in order to help you to build the second component of the database management system that we're gonna build, which we call the buffer manager. The buffer manager is like a component at the top. The, you know that if you study the operating system, so you are familiar what you're talking about here. You know that when you try to operate on to any page or block or any data, this data must be available in the main memory. If it's not there, 
then we need to fetch the block that contains this data from the desk to the main memory. And that's what we're doing here, the buffer pool here, or the buffer manager, <laughs> which allow in order to ask to, uh, what, to read and write the data from the, main, from the desk to the main memory. Of course, the buffer pool or buffer manager is going to have a limited space. For example, my buffer pool allow me to have, for example, only two blocks. So we are going to find a way in order to how to get rid or evict or to say uh, have come up with a free space or free one space or one slot here in the buffer pool for the a new block if there is no space. For example, you have a block one and two are there here, and now we need to access or fetch block three. If the block three is not available in the main memory and you didn't have a space. Now we need to perform what is called the replacement policy. We are going to cover all these details more later in the class. But just I give you a, a, like a hint, an idea, what kind of uh, programming assignment you need to build, how can you perform that? Since we don't have a place here, I'm going to do the replacement policy. That means you say maybe based on the replacement policy, the oldest uh, block that we didn't use for a long time is two, now we need to remove two. Make sure the two maybe modify this one in the main memory. If modify this one, you have to reflect or write the change to the desk. Then after that, now you fetch block three and store it in the same in the place of the block two. That's the buffer manager. Then after that, we're gonna build what is called the record manager. Which in this case, in file we did at the beginning, the data is gonna be uh, or the file can be stored as a sequence of blocks, right? But now I need to take a look at how what's the content of this block. So the file is going to be like a relation, a student relation, okay, which is, contains student ID name and let's say the GBA. So we have the student one, I have Alice, and the GBA 3.0, and etc. Okay, so now I'm going to store this data, which we have the ID and the Alice uh, as a name and the GBA a record in the block which is called the record manager, which how can we store records into, let's say, uh, blocks into the uh, desk. Okay, so of course you have to insert, you have to delete, and etc. So this is the third coding assignment. The fourth coding assignment, remember, the third coding assignment, you're going to use your buffer pool, because when you try to insert a new Block record into a specific block. You need to fetch this block to the main memory, modify this one, then after that, reflect the change to the desk. Right? Then, after that, now we're going to take a look to the fourth coding assignment, which I'm going to say uh, the hardest one, the complicated one, actually, or the longest one. Uh, here, in this case, we are going to perform the P plus tree. I'm going to index. Indexing, generally speaking, is the way in order to help us in order to speed up the access to the data, right? So we are going to encourage you or ask you to build the B plus G index structure, which allow in the top of the uh, storage manager and the buffer manager and the record manager that we have. Okay, all the theoretical part that you need in order to help you in order to build these coding assignments, we are going to cover them in the class. And I'm going to remind you with this structure over and over during the course of the semester. So we're going to see that maybe if you lecture, we're going to say, remember the structure that we did here? First, we are going to see how the data can be start. We have the file, how to store the file is the blocks. Then after that, how to do the block manager or the buffer manager. Then after that, how to do the record manager. Then after that, how can we do the indexing? So all that we need is going to be covered in the class. Okay, so those are the four coding assignments that we are going to cover in the class. Make sense? Clear? So, let me go back here. Okay, so in total, we do have four assignments. There will be one on the top of the other. Okay, you start with the storage manager. And you are going to implement your own tiny, say, database management system like system, I mean, from scratch. Of course, you are not going to be able to build everything, but at least you build a few components, okay? So, some of the, or each of these assignments are going to have like some optional parts, so like extra credit. So, each coding assignment is going to work to say 100 points. And if you do some extra, let's say, credit extra assignments, you're going to have 
between, you say, 5 up to 20% extra for every single coding assignment. So you get a chance in order to get extra credit. Okay? All the assignments, as you mentioned, must be implemented using the C language or C, C++. Uh, for every single assignment, you're going to have like some test cases. Once you're done from your coding assignment, you need just to execute uh, one or two test case files. Which is going to test your code and give you some error message. If you have found error message, then you need just to fix your code. If your code does all the error message, then you are fine. You did the job that we're looking for. Okay? I encourage you maybe to add some additional test cases because some students gonna change the structure, add some functionality which is not covered in the test cases. So in this case, if you add something different, so you can add additional test cases. Feel free to change the structure of the code that you have if it needs. Okay? The source code gen is gonna be managing the getter bus tree. So I expect for each group member is gonna have bitbox account. Once you create an account, you can do collaborate with your group members. Then after that, just uh, send invitation to me and to the TTA. Hopefully, you're gonna have a TA that uh, give us uh, read permission or read access right to your repository in order to allow us to just to download. I mean, the coding assignment of different faces. Okay, you are not gonna submit anything. Just put everything in the. Uh, bit back to repository and do the due date. We are going to pull back, I mean, the data or download the data in order to see what we have done. Okay. Uh, make up exams, hopefully, well, not have this unless you are like you know, health reasons, issues, you cannot attend the final exam uh, or the midterm exam. So just let me know. Hopefully, you are not going to reach this point, but hopefully, we can. Uh, let's say, we, well, I'm not going to perform a makeup exam unless you, we need to do that. Just feel free to just read me out and we try to figure out a solution. So we start with the crossover view. So I'm going to start with the file organization and access. So then I'll go over the buffer management, performance analysis, storage management. We're going to start to show you the way how they did can be stored in the desk. So we're going to go file manager, okay. Our storage manager in general, okay? We get to storage uh, manager, platform manager, record manager, and we get to take a look to the index structure, okay? Then after that, we get to talk about the database system architecture more details. We're gonna go over the query optimizations. So we're gonna take a look to see once, what's gonna happen here when you send your SQL query or command or statement. What's going to happen inside the database management system? There are the many steps until you get the final result. That's what is called the query optimization. So step by step, we're going to show you with more details uh, what's going to happen, what's going to help us later and come up with a perform better or write better uh, query command or statement. I'll also understand the query optimization going to help us in order to uh, understand how the database management system works here. Uh, we are going to take a look to the transaction management, recovery and concussing, concussing control. We're going to see how the database management system before the recovery uh, uh, from the earth of, and how can you achieve uh, safe concurrent access to the data. If we have time, we're going to take a look the reliability protection, but I'm not sure we can reach this one. Hopefully, if you have a time, you just going to stop here on this part here. Okay. So the course objectives as following. After attending the course, hopefully the student is going to be able to do the following. At least you do understand the design decisions behind the textbook database management system. I mean the default structure, okay, or what's covered in the textbook, what's the naive or solution, uh, way in order to implement the database management system. Then I will try to talk about, for example, give you some examples, what are we doing, for example, what the current database management system doing. For example, we talk about the way that how the data can be organized on the desk. I'm going to try to give you some examples, for example, what the Postgres or how Postgres is going to store the data, how the Oracle is going to store the data, and etc. So at least we try to connect whatever we cover in the class with the real world, to say, uh, a database management system. 
Now the uh, trade-off between different storage organization technique, I'm gonna show you different ways how to organize the data on the desk. Then I'm gonna give you like more details so we can uh, trade off why you use this one, why we try to avoid that one because that one is not efficient and etc. okay? Be able to build part of the small size with tiny database management system uh, from scratch. Hopefully this one gonna be like, which is gonna be covered in the uh, class uh, or coding assignments. Understand the basic query optimizations. Generally speaking, you're gonna see when you send your SQL query, the database management system go over many steps in order to try to figure out or find out different plans in order to execute the square. Then after that, the database management system is gonna find out a way in order to choose the cheapest plan. When they say the cheapest plan, not the one is less costly, uh, actually less cost. Doesn't mean the cheapest, that means bad quality. No, the fastest one, the most efficient way in order to execute the square. And remember, when you study the SQL, uh, query language, we've said that the SQL query language is declarative language. This means it's non-procedural. This means just you are going to tell the database management system what kind of information you're looking for, but you're not gonna, uh, I mean, you are not gonna tell how the database management system gonna, uh, which step or how can they get the result. So we're gonna feel or leave this job to the database management system in order to decide what's the best way, what's the best plan in order to execute your query. So we're gonna cover this one in more details. This is interesting, by the way, take a look. And we're gonna give you some examples how to analyze your SQL statement. And you're gonna see that with most, uh, for the Postgres, mainly I'm gonna go over the Postgres more details uh, when you go over the tutorials because I already saw the Postgres. And you can try to test whatever tutorial we cover in this class to know that uh, using different or your favorite database management system. But we're gonna see that when you perform query optimization, you're gonna see that how the query plan can be organized and what kind of the plan the database management system used in order to execute this query. Okay. Uh, know the standard implementation of the relational operation. We're gonna like uh, mainly we are going to cover the join operation. If you understand the join operations, so the rest aggregation set operation can be easy because the most complicated or complex operation will be the join. What do you mean by this one? I'm gonna show you later when you have a SQL query you send to the database management system. The database management system is gonna find out in order way to come up with a parse tree that, 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 that translates that using the expression tree which can be exposed or expressed by or represented by the relational algebra. Then after that come up with the logical plan. Which is the plan that I'm gonna perform. For example, you can say you have a relational join with S, then after that perform selection, then after that projection. This is my plan. Okay, this is the logical plan. Then the physical plan here, for every single operator we have here, you have a different implementation, different algorithms allow you in order to perform the join operation, yeah? So here, this one for logical plan, assume that we have four, let's say, different implementation or algorithm we can use in order to perform a join here, operation. So here we can end up, we have four physical plans. What do you mean the physical plan? That means for every single operator that we have, I'm gonna substitute this one with the exact implementation. So in this case, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna use nested loop, for example. Join, in order to perform join. The other plan, I'm gonna use, let's say, uh, sort and merge. Another plan, maybe you're gonna use, let's say, uh, hash. Another plan, you use index, join. So we have a different implementation. Then after that, you can force the selection. If you have a multiple different implementation, each of them is gonna produce or come out with a plan, okay? Then after that, now you need to compute the cost. Then after that, you're gonna say, oh, this is using, for example, uh, let's say, uh, merge join or sort merge algorithm to perform the join is the cheapest one, the less costly one. So this is the one that is gonna be implemented, can be used, okay? I'm gonna cover all these details later in the class. <laughs> Of course, you're going to be able to estimate the cost of executing an operator query based on the database of statistics. You're going to see how can you perform this operation and which is the one that's going to be applied inside the database management system. You're going to know 
hopefully by the end of the class with the standard database indexing techniques. I'm gonna give you like some details about different indexing techniques. Then I'll start give you some examples, for example, what the Postgres uses, what the Oracle uses. Oracle uses, for example, this kind of technique or this indexing. One sec. I'm keep, sorry, I'm keeping sneezing all time, all day long. So anyway, you are safe, by the way, you are online, okay? The virus is not gonna be transmitted through the connection. Unless maybe you're gonna end up with have another virus that can do that. Okay, hopefully if you get the time, definitely this semester we're gonna have a time to take a look to the concussion control and the recovery mechanism. How the database managed to have multiple user access the data at the same time and will come up with the same environment. How can we, for example, recover from the error? What if I try to perform some operation transaction with money, for example, from account A and B, then something bad happened in the middle. So how can we recover from this kind of, let's say, uh, failure? All of them is interesting subject. As I mentioned, too much to cover, but don't worry, okay? I'm not gonna ask you the exam every single thing. The most important thing I wanted from you to understand the basic concepts, and also I wanted from you to do the coding assignment. Okay, so this is just, I mean, the course outline. I want to try to blend in the first weeks and the second, hopefully you are going to finish three subjects. The week three, we are going to different using, I mean, go over the indexing and hashing technique with the techniques that use in order to perform the indexing, especially data structure, which is gonna help us to not speed up access the data. Uh, then after that, we take a look at query processing and the query recovery, concussing control, or query optimization. I feel. So hopefully we're gonna cover all these details during this semester. Okay, there's many textbooks, you can use them, although you didn't need any of them. Okay, those are the most of the slides that we cover here is adapted from this textbook. I know it's 2008, but don't worry, I'm trying to, I'm keeping updating my slides. So you're gonna see that when you talk about something here, I'm gonna give you like the, what's the formal definition, for example, how it works, and after that, try to connect this one to the current database management system that we have out, out there in the real world. So don't worry, don't say this outdated and etc. okay? Because you see some textbook 2016, so I'll try to mix different, I mean, slides or different subjects from different slides and different resources. So again, you didn't need to buy anything, and the shop that's associated with this book is gonna be available in the reading uh, folder. So you see that if you go to the assignments, then under the assignment to the reading, you're gonna see that the first uh, chapter one, which is the one gonna be covered in a few minutes. This is an important date. Please, if you take a screenshot for this one, because this is a very important one. Okay, I update this one yesterday night. I tried to make sure that for every single, single coding assignment, you're gonna have 10 days to finish one. Almost, okay? I give you more time for the last coding assignment. I think, yeah, I'm, this is the due date, by the way, the last day that I can give you. Please don't ask me for the extension for the coding assignment, the fourth one, because after this date, I have to submit the final grades to the register. Otherwise, I'm gonna be in trouble. So I have to finish this one. So be after this date, unfortunately, I can't give you extra time. That's why I encourage you, please start early. I'm going to assign today after the end of the class, the first coding assignment. You're gonna take a look to the, I mean, to the description. Someone is gonna say, but you assigned, but we didn't cover the theoretical part. Don't worry, at least I want to from you to familiarize yourself with the, the coding, how it works, how can you, for example, read the code, uh, if you forget the C or C++ language, language, so now your chance in order to go over this one quick. The first coding assignment, it's easy. This is the due date of the first coding assignment. <laughs> then after that, I'm gonna hand out the second coding assignment and etc. okay? Uh, I didn't include the quizzes because the quizzes I expect for the quiz to cover specific materials. So I'm not sure when that material is gonna be covered. It depends on the piece, uh, pace of the class, whether it's gonna be covered in uh, maybe two weeks, three weeks, uh, so I'm not sure. So anyway, once to cover the material that I plan to include in the quiz one, I'm gonna uh, notify you about the date of the quiz one. And once we use the material that I plan to cover the second quizzes, 
So that means I'm going to notify you, okay? I will give you time, so don't worry. I'm not gonna say, okay, to move the quest, so I'll give you enough time to perform that. Okay, any question? Okay. So let's take a look at the second part of today's lecture. Yeah, I may forget to mention something here. So usually the class is going to be from 6 to 9, 10. So I will divide the class into two parts. The first one is going to be 6 up to 7.30. Then the second one it will be up to seven, from 7.45 up to 9, 10. Okay? So we're going to have like 15 minutes, okay, rest between uh, the class, okay? You're gonna see that too much information. So three hours, I think, to get continuous given the class, uh, uh, it's gonna be hard to follow. Okay. So let's start first here. Yeah, we talk about the database. Just I wanted to remind you with the definition of the database in general here. Yeah. So what's the database here? Database, generally speaking, is defined as what an organized collection of interrelated data that models some aspect of the real world. Okay, for example, it's going to be modeling the student in, say, a class in the university database. Uh, we do have like the database management system, and the data management database management system is what is defined as following: is what it's going to be like a database plus a set of software that allow us or application programs that allow us in order to access and manipulate the data stored in the system in more efficient and a convenient way. Okay, of course, the database management system is going to offer a lot of features. Okay, one of them is going to be of, uh, allow us to have data that can be persistent and also allow us, you know, give us this what is called some concurrency control about the data and uh, recovery, failure, failure recovery, or cache recovery. We call this one is better and allow, give us the way a better way in order to have, or let's say, assign or specify, let's say, security. To the data, you can specify who can access what in the data. Fine grained, you can specify. We have a multiple users, and this specific user can access what part of the data, whether they're going to entire the data or the portion of the data. You can specify who can perform what. For example, if you have a multiple user, you can specify who can perform insertion, who can perform uh, deletion, and who can perform update operation, etc. Okay? So we do have, I mean, the query with other operation that extract or retrieve the data. That's why we call the query language. Because speaking, we are going to perform selection in this case. The data can be stored using this uh, uh, data model. So mainly here, we are just focused on the relational data model with what the wide uh, use data model, the way that how can you organize, how can you store the data on the uh, or capture the structure of the data. So in the relational data model, the data can be stored as a tables. When you store the data at the tables, for example, if you have a relational student, so the relational student gonna be uh, looks like something like this. You have a student ID, you have a name, and you have a GBA, for example. So you store the data in the column, which is specified had unique columns, each of them had a unique name. And we have a tuples, where the tuples gonna have like a value for each column. There's, for example, you have the student ID 1 and the name is Alice and GBA 3.0. So this is the first tuple that stored the data. We do have a schema, which defines the description of the structure of the data in the database. Okay, or to give us the metadata about the data or data about the data in general. So the schema in this case, the student, you're going to have the following structure. You're going to have the ID and you're going to specify what the data type of the ID it can be intro, with a numeric, for example, double, uh, var, char, char, whatever. Then after that, the name, and specify the data type. Then after that, the GBA, and specify the data type. This is, I mean, the logical schema. Of course, we have a physical schema, we have a view schema. I'm not going to go with more details. Just I want just to remind you, make sure that you are on the same page. We define the database management system because we have many people confused between database and database management system. The database, which is the actual data that can be stored on the desk. 
okay, with the actual data, that, for example, university database. The database management system or the database system, which this, uh, is called uh, the set of software that allow us in order to store, manipulate, modify the data that's stored in the database system. In more efficient and convenient way here. Okay, so advanced database organization is what? Is about database system implementation. So how to implement the database system and hopefully we're gonna have fun doing it. At least I do have fun, we teach this class. I'm not sure about you, whether you're gonna have fun doing the coding assignment or not. Hopefully you're gonna have, okay? So what do you want, just speaking from the database? The most important thing is, uh, go, uh, went over these, I mean, some property of the task that you wanted to achieve from the database management system, but just speaking, the most important thing that I want from the database management system is keep the data persistent. That means when you store something in the database system, when you try to get back next day or after one month or whatever, we assume this, there is no system uh, failures, and such, no one compromise the system, no one modify, delete the data, so you're gonna get being able to ask whatever you have stored in the system. <laughs> Is allow me in order to answer a query. I will retrieve the data or access the data and manipulate the data in a more efficient way. And also, and allow to manipulate, that means allow me in order to update the data. This is some features that you want from the database system. Okay. So someone is gonna say, okay, it looks like implementing database management system is too easy or simple. Because what it looks like you have? You have a relation. Then you're gonna send some statement or some request or some query. Then after that, you're gonna end up you have a result, right? So it looks like you are waste you wasting our time when you try to talk about the database. Well, so what I'm going to do? I try to convince you that implementing database management system, it's not simple. Okay. So I'm going to introduce to the imaginary database system. So please don't try to do a CV that you implement, let's say, a tiny database management system called Megatron 3000 from scratch. Then you start wondering why you didn't get response for, or you didn't get any job offer. This is a imaginary database system. So someone is gonna say, okay, it looks like implementing database management system similar to what we planning to do right now. So this is not, you say existing database system. It's like faked one. The one that we think so, if we implement database management system, gonna be looks like this faked system. Because remember what you said, we do have a relation, we're gonna have a statement, then after that we're gonna end up we have the result. Okay? So assume that we have mega twenty thousand with a fake database management system. The lates from this you have some fancy words here, say I we pretend this is the latest from the Megatron Labs, incorporates to say latest relational technology is Unix compatible and lightweight and cheap. Okay, interesting, nice. Let's see how this database system works here. So the this database management system, the faked one, okay? Let me write this one faked. Okay, uh, use the file system. So in this case, remember, when you talk about the database management system or database organization of the CH125, if you attend this class, the first lecture, your instructor is going to try to convince you that we need to have the database management system. We cannot rely on the file system in order to take care of the file. So we need to find a, or create a database management system because we, if we rely on the file system, we're going to have many issues, okay? many shortcomings, okay? That we cover CS4 to 5. I will try to cover something different. We are trying to have a fake system with relying on the file system, which try to mimic the database management system tasks, okay? So the database, we assume that, it's gonna be stored, let's say, in the ASCII files, or maybe you can use comma separated file, value, CSV file, if you want. So let's assume the data gonna be stored in the ASCII, okay? And for every single relation, we're gonna use separate file. For example, how many relations do we have? We do have a student relation. So I'm gonna create a file called student. Maybe it's gonna be text file or CSV file, whatever you wanna do, okay? Let's use text file because it's easy to work with. Then, 
if we have another file or another relation, I'm going to create a new file which contains the information about that relation. For example, you have instructor text. Okay, so another file. Okay. So each entity, as you mentioned, can be uh, stored in its own file. So, for example, we have student, my own file, instructor, own file. The application is going to have to parse files. So that means we're going to have one application in order to allow us in order to parse the files each time it wants, for example, to read or update your account. We're going to try to access the file information with the student, either update or modify or get some data. So in this case, you have to perform what is called the parse. You have to parse every single line of this file in order to extract the information that you're looking for. I will get the, to the parsing later, okay? So each entity or each relation is going to have what? I try to, I prefer to use entity is better, has its own set of attributes. For example, for the student, going to have like name and ID and the department. Okay? So in each file, we are going to have different records. And these different records are going to be delimited by new lines. So you're going to have, this is the first record, this is the second record, this is the third record, and etc. Of course, we do have some specific instruction. We need to figure out the way how to separate the element from that belongs or the value that belongs to different fields. The first one's supposed to have like the name, yeah. The second one's supposed to contain the second data or element in each record. It's, gonna, it's supposed to have the ID value, and the third column is supposed to have the department. Since you're gonna use the text file, someone maybe gonna say use a space. To as a delimit, I mean, in order to just say uh, each of the corresponding attributes within the record are delimited by this say special marker character may use a bound. Okay, so in this case this is the first value. But either you can use a space if you want, or maybe you use a bound. Someone maybe argue said, what if the name has uh, two names, for example, uh, Lee uh, space X Y Z or whatever. So in this case, maybe the system gonna be confused between the space that belongs or it's gonna be part of the name with the space gonna use it as a special marker to let's say to separate. I mean, uh, to separate. I mean the values with each attribute within the record. So anyway, I'm gonna use the bound. So this is the first record. This is the second record, and etc. So so far so good. This is the way how the data can be organized here. Okay, so this uh, launch is, uh, by the way, let's go back here. Once, uh, uh, I missed one point here. So each of the relations can be stored in this, uh, say, folder, or this subfolder. You can use student and use your student of text, for example. We do have a schema. We try to memory the database manager system. So we're gonna have like a schema file, which special file is named schema. And this file is going to contain, you say, a line, different lines, or different records, and each record is going to contain information or schema that are related to, let's say, each table. Sorry, guys. I'm going to continue the class, regardless of the flu, regardless of sneezing, whatever. Okay, so this is a schema, as you mentioned, and going to have, like, different records, and each record is going to contain information that related or the schema that corresponds to a specific file. So in this case, since we have a student, our the first one, I'm gonna use this use this one. It's better here. We have like the relation name, the first value, bound, the second value is gonna be the attribute, bound, the data type, of the domains. Then it's about the second attribute. <coughs> Sorry, okay. And the second attribute add etc. So it just looks like we're gonna create a store the schema here. And the schema can be stored into, let's say, a specific folder, or specific file, actually, can be schema.txt. Okay? Assume that we start to launch the system, okay, it works fine. And this is just, I mean, the login information. Anyway, so assume that when you try, this is the prompt line, and here you need to write your query. So this will say, select a start from the student and this bound here. Of course, under this, I'm going to show you how can we extract the information. But this one is gonna just display or give me the result from this relation student. So how gonna, this one gonna be executed here? So it's gonna get X first. It's gonna uh, take a look to the schema of the relation student. Okay. Then after that, it's going to get all the attributes of this relation student. So it's gonna be name and ID and the department. It's going to display or print out these 
the header as a header. Then after that, it's going to go over every single tuple. That means in this case, it's going to be parse, I mean, each file. We'll parse the file each time we want to read the data. When you do the parse, remember, we have like a smith. Let's go back here. Something like this. When you parse this one, you have this is the entire line. Then you need to figure out you split the data or into different tokens based on the bound. That's what we call the process one. In order to extract the data. So you're gonna get Smith for the first the name, the second value you get is gonna be for the ID, and the third one gave you for the department. Then after that, you are going to print out this value and continue doing this operation. Once you're done, you're gonna add, for example, show me the prompt bound. Okay. Assume here we use the pound as a semicolon on the way that in order to tell the system this is, I mean, the end of the query. This is not important. So, so far, so good. So, I can write my code here, which allow me in order to get this result. Yeah? Again, you're going to read the schema to get, I mean, the attributes of relation a student. Student, sorry. Then after that, display the attributes of this relation. Then after that, as a header. Then after that, read the entire file, uh, which is student. Then for each line, it's going to pass exact information, the name, the ID, the button, then print out. We'll display the result. <laughs> so it's fine. There's no problem. Assume that we have the ability in order to store the data and send the result to the printer. Use like the, uh, uh, the symbol just to say select to start with this student. Then after that, the vertical bar. And then I'm going to say, OK, LPR print the result to the Let's say to the printer. Okay, we can write my code. The first part is gonna be similar, the same structure, the same algorithm that we use, or the same program, and instead to display those out on the desk or up into, on, on the monitor, I'm gonna print it there. So it looks like okay, it's doable, there's no problem. You can store this information instead to print out the result, you're gonna do what? In this case, you can say uh, print out the result or store the result into another file. So since we are going to create a new relation, so here we have to do the same process that we did here. For example, the low ID, which is going to have information about the student, they have less than 100. So if you take a look to the uh, uh, the way that uh, this is going to be organized, we need to create a new file. This file is going to be low ID, which contains the, ID, ID, the name of the ID, and the third one is going to be the, uh, the department, right? Then I'm going to store the formation of the result here into this file. Once I'm done, I need to go to the schema and add another line it's called low ID here. And this one gonna have the name, for example, str string, for example, ID, integer, for example, and let's say department, which is gonna be string answer. Okay, something like that. Because we add a new table to the relation or to the existing database. Can I do this one? Yes, you can write your Java code, which works fine perfectly in this case. Okay, let's take a look how the make account can be executed these squares. In order to execute the squares, select the start from the relation where we do have a condition. This is the way how can we write my code in order to perform this operation. So we're gonna take a look at the schema first. Definitely you have to access the schema to get the list of attributes associated with this relation R. Then after that, check whether the if this one is say a greater than five, you need to make sure whether a the relation R has the attribute a or not. If not, then you get me an error. If yes, that means you're gonna do what? Display the attribute relation as the header. Then after that, read the file R. Then for each line that you find, you need to pass the entry. Then after that, you need to figure out what's the value that you're looking for. Maybe it's gonna be the IDs, for example, equal five. You check the value. Take with the condition valid for this tuple. If yes, display the result. Then, otherwise, in both cases, either yes or no, you have to go to the perform the same operation to the next tuple edited. So it looks like so far so good. It's easy. So why we need to bother ourselves? Let's have another example here. We tried to build, we could say, store the result into another relation. So you're going to perform the same select as we did before on the previous slide. Read the schema from the relation R, get the attributes of R, and check the validity of the condition. Then after that, display uh, the attribute relation R as a header. And here, in this case, I need just to write the result to the new file. Then after that, I need to make sure that we add a new entry for the schema for this file. Okay, so, so far, so good. Still, 
I didn't see any benefit using the database management system. At least my system works fine. Assume that you have more complicated query that is going to involve, let's say, drawing uh, two relations. So you take a log in this case. Select two attributes from the relation R and S where well, they have a specific condition. I know what kind of condition here. So this is the way how we implement that. Now things are going to be different here. So you're going to take a look and say, okay, this is not the best way to do that. We do have a better way. So first we take a look at the schema to get the relation R and S. You go to the schema file, extract the information. You can do that easily. Then you can see or you take a look to, I mean, read the first the relation R file first, and for every single line, remember how to perform this one, relation R and S. So we're gonna perform nested loop in this case to perform the join. I'm going to read each tuple, let's say R belongs to the relation R. And for each tuple, I'm, I'm going to join this one every, with every single tuple S belongs to the relation S. Okay, so that you need to perform for every single tuple R that belongs to the relation S, and gonna be joined with every single tuple S is gonna belong to the relation S. Okay, so that we perform this operation. Once we have like, it depends whatever the joint condition that we have, since we are allowed to perform this joint operation, so in this case, I'm going to display just extract that to beat A, B, because that's what I want from A, B, from concatenating from the tuple for the relation R with the tuple of relation S. So if you ask you about, what do you think about this implementation? Whether this is a good implementation to perform a join or not? So what do you think here? Exactly, it's inefficient. So it looks like we have a better way in order to perform the join here, especially if we have a large or a huge amount of data. If the relation R has a million of records and the relation has a million of records, we need to perform the join like this, this is an efficient, it's not a good idea. So definitely we have a better way. And we're gonna go over different ways that we can use in order to perform the join. So what's wrong with whatever we cover right now? Again, we do have a relation, then we have a statement, then we're gonna get the result. So why we still not satisfied with this implementation? So definitely the database management system is not implemented like our imaginary or fake Mega 12 system. Okay? Whatever implementation we just described is not efficient, is not adequate, okay? For the application that involves significant amount of data, especially if you have a large amount of data, or maybe we have multiple users that try to access the data. I'm gonna go over a partial list of problems, follow this structure or this implementation. The first one, the way that layout the disk or the data on the disk is not efficient. We use the ASCII file, yeah? And we said the database is gonna do what? For each entity, we're gonna have like it's stored in its own file. And then in this case, each entity is gonna have its whole own set of attributes. And uh, so in each file, we have a different records are delimited by new lines. And each, say, of the corresponding attributes within the records are delimited by the special marker character down. The way they layout the data is not efficient here. Why? If you try to modify any piece of information, you have to use the whole file. For example, assume that we, have, we need to define or create or move or change the computer size to the computer size department. So in this case, I need to interact with every single tuple. And for every single tuple, I want to check the computer size department with the equals computer size, then I want to change this one with the computer size department, and etc. So that means you end up, you have, maybe you end up, you have to write the entire file because you have to ask, you have to modify the data. If you wanted to delete one tuple, maybe you're gonna cause you to open new file, uh, ask, take every single tuple, it's gonna be does match the condition, and remove only or exclude the tuple that does match the condition. So the way that we lay out the data on the disk is not efficient. The structure that you use in order to build in order to capture the formation of attributes and the instance, in other general speaking, of the uh, entity is not efficient, is not good to work. It's still expensive here. Okay, this is a problem layout of the data. The second one, we try to search. We select the style from the relation where the student ID or the ID is equal to specific value. 
Again, here we are going to perform what's called the brute force here. I need to elaborate over every single possible, let's say, tuple that's stored in this relational record. I need to pass, then after that, I need to check whether the ID that I'm not before is equal to specific value or not, satisfy the condition that we have. So we end up, we have to read the entire or full relations. And we don't have any indexing. Did, you, did, you, did they mention that the way that we are going to build an index, then we can build or use index? Using the ASCII, the way that's what they did, it's hard to build an index here. The other problem here is it's what is called the brute force query processing here. I'll give you an example. We try to join the relation, two relations, or extract the formation from more than one relation that if you end up, you're going to perform the join. I show you the simple algorithm that allow us in order to join two relations, and we said that one is not efficient. There is a much better, let's say, or other, let's say, joining algorithm we can use. One of them in this case, if we have an index based, let's say, uh, on the attribute, oh, sorry, based on the attribute B here, or the relation is. I can use an index in order to select or filter out the data. If you take a look to the, let's say, the uh, relate, corresponding relation algebra is the square, you do have what? You're going to perform whatever select, to say, project all. Okay? You have relation R, you have relation S. You need to perform Cartesian product, for example. Then after that, you have a selection. R dot A is equal S dot A. And you're going to have S dot B is greater than 1,000. This is one of that. We do have another plan. I can push the selection down here. I can project. There is no need, by the way, to perform the projection because here I can assume that all the tuple, I mean, the column is going to be part of the result. <laughs> anyway, you can have a selection r dot a equals say s dot a, and here Cartesian product relation uh, let's say r. Then in the relation s, I'm going to perform the selection early since we do have an index. So this one, I'm going to reduce the number of tuples that satisfy this condition from the relation S. Assume that we have 1,000 records, each relation R and S. Here, I need to perform the Cartesian product for 1,000. When 1,000 could be 1,000, multiply 1,000. If we perform selection, maybe you start 1,000, 1,000. This one, end up, we have only 10 tuples that satisfy this condition. So I'm going to be work with 10 tuples with 1,000 before the Cartesian product. Then after that, do the selection. So this one will be much faster. Another way to perform this one, there is no need to perform the Cartesian product here. We can use the theta join here. Okay, and basically in this case, it's going to be r dot a is equal to say s dot a. Yeah, and the relation r selection with s dot b is greater than 100 for the relation S, and here we have the projection. So this one definitely can be more efficient than using this. Index. So we have a different algorithm, different ways, in order to use, to say, the uh, come up with an efficient join algorithm, allow me in order to join the relation, which we didn't, we didn't cover in this case. One way to do this one, maybe instead you have a theta join, we have, by the way, in the theta join, we do have many implementations. We can use sort, uh, and merge with one way or another way I'm going to cover this one later and during this class when you talk about the different join algorithm we can use we can use index join uh, join maybe you can use hash join and uh, I mean many of them so each of them is going to have a direction disadvantage anyway the way that we use in our performances I mean operation we uh, using that fake megatron is not a good idea is not efficient and especially if you have a large amount of data here, if you have five, six lines of the file, so in this case, yes, yeah, you use that one. And if you have a single user. We didn't have a buffer manager. I didn't specify anything about the buffer manager. So remember, we try to access the data right now, we have to access the entire relation. Every time you try to perform this operation, you have to access the entire relation. And the, when you talk about the database management system, we do have a way in order to fetch some blocks that will be available in the main memory. We, we keep in saying that we try to prefer, we do have some algorithms, some techniques which allow us in order to keep the most frequently buffers, used buffers that will be available in the main memory. So when we need them, you're going to definitely access them in the main memory without wasting your time to fetch the data from the desk. Okay? So again, in this uh, implementation, Megatron or feeds or imaginary system, all the data comes off the desk all the time. We don't have the buffer, but we don't have a cache. So this is another problem. 
Because if we time to ask the data with a large amount of data, we're going to waste time in order to perform a fetch the data from the desk. During today's class, we're going to talk over this one more details. We're going to try to convince you, I'll just convince you, just show you that uh, asking the data from the desk is expensive for operation, so we will try to avoid it or minimize it. Another thing there, uh, we don't have a con no concurrency control. In this case, what if you have a tool, users try to access student relations, user one and user two, at the same time try to use or modify the student relation. Or oh, one uh, tuple in this case. So in this case, we didn't have any, I don't know if you try to, you try to write this code using Java or whatever, uh, it's not third safe. And in this case, try to have multi third to try to access the same file. And both of them try to modify the data, then try to store the change to the desk. And see what's good. I mean, I cannot, I mean, expect what the outcome of this file. There is diving, there is elusive data. Some of them is going to be lost. And might be depends on the last third or the user that is going to store the data in the file. So in this case, several users can modify a file at the same time with unpredictable result based on the Megatron system. The database management system, definitely that we cover, uh, we use the commercial or this open source, definitely they're gonna have, we're gonna have a chief like a safe a concurrency control. There's no reliability. What do you mean exactly here? What if there's an error? For example, assume you're gonna to modify the computer science to the computer science department. So you ask most of the data, then assume that we have one million records, or let's say uh, 100,000 records. You ask the first 50,000 records, and after that, the system crashed. So do you have a way, based on the technique that I showed to you, or based on the system just to introduce, which allow us another recovery, in this case, that show you, for example, you modify this code or this set of attributes, now you need to go over to, if you wanted to continue your work, you have to start modifying from record 50,001 and up to the end, or we don't have any recovery mechanism that either is going to be undo or redo the committed transaction. Well, I'm going to cover this one later. So anyway, we might going to lose data. And one interesting example, we try to move the data from an account to another account, for example, minus $100 from account A. So they say you need to add $100 to the account B. So you detect, I mean, the $100 from account A, then the system is cash. So what we're gonna do in this case? We count A, we're gonna perform the same operation again. So the count A, or the owner of the count A is gonna cry here, gonna say, complain, come on, you get $100, now you're gonna get another one, and B is gonna say, I didn't receive anything. So they end up, we have a loss of data, or they're gonna have inconsistency of the data. That's the mega 20,000 for the database management system, as we're gonna see in the end, by the end of the semester. We do have some techniques which allow us to go to recover in order to do what's called recovery, uh, crash recovery, or failure recovery. The other problem here is like, I'm not gonna know security, but we don't have like fine-grained security. So we're keeping, say, the security cores. What does that mean in this case? Either, based on the file system, if you have a file one, or the student here, the text here, you have either read, write, execute, yeah? for the owner, uh, and read, write, execute for the, see, the group, and you have read, write, X to anyone else, or the others. This is the way that, how can we control or specify the X, write, or the permission for the, see, for the file in the Linux system, right? So here, uh, if you have a multiple user, either gonna allow the user to access the entire file for reading, write, or execute. But here in this case, I need to have fine-grained access to the data. In other words, in the student, we do have an ID, we have a name, and we have a department, right? I want to specify, for example, for the user 1, which can access the ID and the department, for example. For the user 2, can modify, for example, the name attribute, or can perform select, or can perform specific attribute, I mean, access or item permission based on the attribute base. We cannot do this one in the file system or the Megatron that I just produced or just introduced using the Megatron 3000 because this one will lie on the file system, which is the, going to inherit the security property of the file system. So it's not going to work in this case. But 
for the uh, this commercial or the open source database management system, you're going to see that you have the ability in order to control grant access rights or the permissions uh, based on the, the entire relation and also based on the specific attribute. Actually, some database management system allow you to perform the access right based on the set of tools too. This not, now starting to make funny a little bit from the system. There's no application program interface when you use the system. What does that mean here in this case? We'll try to connect the payroll program to get the data. For example, we have a data stored there. It's going to be student as the files. We have like instructor, etc. Now we have a payroll program. I don't want to you can use this payroll program. You're going to access the data that's stored using the Megatron system. There's no application program interface we can use them. For example, there is no GDBC, for example, or that if you use a Python, there is no Psycho BG which allow you to connect to ask the data in order to achieve the data from your program or from your application. Cannot interact with other database management system. I didn't show you that how can we move the data from this system with the Postgres or other system. There's no compatibility. There's no graphical user interface. That's the funny one. So, I mean, just speaking, uh, what we cover right now, I will take away from this part of this second part of today's lecture, implementing database management system is not easy, okay? So, you're going to see that there's a lot of stuff, a lot of components we need to take care of. It. So, this course, again, is going to introduce you to the better way of the building database management system. One point, one hint about the... Uh, if you are not forget about the SQL or SQL, by the way, whether it be SQL, whether SQL, whatever you're gonna call, it, we are on the same page. Okay, so if you are interested to just to view the SQL query language, uh, the relation algebra, so either you're gonna Google this one, or the, whatever you have earlier course notes, we can Google this one, or maybe you can go over this link where it contains some slides. I'm not going to ask you to go over all the slides, just take a look at the slides that relate to the SQL query language. It's going to help you just on the relation of Java. That is just to review your, I mean, uh, knowledge. Make sure that, or update yourself. Make sure that you still remember that. So there is a reading, which is going to be in the blackboard. If you want to go over this one, although actually you don't need this one because we cover everything that we need. But if you want to learn more, you can go to the assigned the reading folder, okay? And this case is going to be fine. I mean, the chapter one is going to be introduction to database bunch of system implementation, okay? So the second or the third part of the lecture, I'm going to talk about the hardware. So I think I'm going to take the... Uh, the rest early, okay? So let's go back at 7.35, uh, okay? Let's go this one after this time. Because I want to start this uh, chapter of the third one in the fresh, uh, okay? So let's see, let's see you in 7.35. Or let's say 7.36. Give you one extra. Okay guys, welcome back. So the third part of today's lecture, we're going to talk about the hardware. In more details, we're going to talk about the data storage or the storage manager in general. So we already understand in the CS4 to 5 what the database looks like, okay? At the logical level and how to write the queries in order to read, write data from it, and etc. That we cover the CS4 to 5. In this course, we are going to start to learn how to build the software that manages the database, okay? So, <clears throat> just speaking, study of the data storage in the database management system, which is the one that we're going to start talking about, starting today's lecture. There are mainly two issues we need to address, which relate to how the database management system is going to deal with large amount of data efficiently because the goal of database management system we do have a large amount of data that the database management system is gonna find out where in order to allow us to know the X modify the set of data more efficient and convenient way. 
Okay, the first problem, we need to take a look. How does the computer system store and manage very large amount of data? How are we going to organize them into this? And the second problem, or the issue, we're going to see later, what kind of representation and the data structure best support the efficient manipulation of this data? Before I go over this one, I'm going to go over what is called the hardware of the desk, or the secondary storage. Then I'm going to show you the way, since mainly we are going to focus in this class on the desk oriented database management system here. So we assume the data is going to be stored in the desk. Okay, so it's worth mentioning. I was going to spend some time in order to understand how the data stored in the desk, how the disk looks like, how can we access the data from and store the data to the desk. So we're going to go over the ax time with the time that allow me to spend in order to request for the specific block that wasn't available in the main memory and to that block is going to be available at the main memory. Then we'll go over some optimization, how to make the access time, what we can do in order to reduce the access time and more, more, more efficient, either, either going to organize the data and uh, maybe double buffering it, etc. Then we go over other topics, for example, how, what you mean by the storage costs using the secondary storage and the disk failures, and etc. So back to the, our subject here. Mainly in this class, as I mentioned here, we are going to focus on the desk-oriented database management system. What does that mean here? Mean that the desk-oriented database management system, uh, in this case, means that is the one that where the set of software makes, or the software or the application makes the assumption that the primary storage location used in order to store the data is the secondary or the non volatile storage. Okay, so mainly we are going to store the data in the desk. If you store the data in the desk, so the file we're gonna see that next lecture the file is gonna be stored as what as the sequence of the of the fixed length blocks. We call them slotted base or blocks in the desk. So we have one file with gonna be specific relation, and the file is gonna be stored as the sequence of blocks or patients on the desk. Okay. So 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 this means we need uh, the database management system. <laughs> has a component, okay, which manage, I mean, the moving the data between, the say, the non volatile I mean, and the volatile storage. What does that mean here? You know that the data can be stored in the desk, okay? You see that this is my data here. And this is my block one, or block two, let's say one, two, up to n block. This is my data. We're going to see how can we organize that. Definitely, we're going to have what's called, I mean, the page directory we're going to have Keep tracking the data, it's gonna help me like specific page, which is gonna tell me exactly how can we access the data, where I'm gonna find the data that's not for that belongs to that file. For simplicity, assume that the data right now sequence of the blocks, okay? All these blocks are gonna be have a fixed length. It's not variable length. Good. So when you try to fetch the data, since the data main storage is gonna be the desk, so there's a chance that maybe the block that I'm looking for is not available in the main memory. So it's not here in the main memory. And you know that the block or the value that you're looking for must be resides in the main memory in order to perform the computational processing. If it's not there, so that means you need to find a way in order for there's a specific component of the database management system gonna take care of the form of operation. Fetch the data from the disk to the main memory. For example, I'm looking for the block one. The block one does not exist in the main memory, so or the buffer. So I'm gonna send a request to the database, maybe that's a block one, and but fetches the block one to the data or to the main memory. Now you can pass or uh, perform the operation here. So how the data is stored in non volatile I mean storage is crucial. It's very important in order to help us to understand how the data is gonna be asked to respond to the queries and modify the data. In other words, again, keep your mind, since I'm keeping repeating myself, since the data we are going to focus on desk oriented database management system. So the main storage, okay, or the primary storage location of the data is gonna be the secondary storage, or say into the desk. So there's a chance that when you try to log in or access the data, the data is not gonna be available in the memory. 
whenever you want to access any piece of information and the block the data, the data must be somehow available in the main memory. If it's not there, then you have to fetch the data from the desk to the main memory in order to perform the operation or pass the data. Once you have done, there is a chance you modify the data, then you need to reflect the change back to the desk before you move this block from the data or from the buffer, manager or buffer pool. Ask the data, well, fetch the data from the desk is an expensive operation, which I'm going to cover in this part of this class. We're going to show you that we try to perform the data, we're going to perform uh, some operations, yeah, which allow you, you know, that will say the X time in order to perform or fetch the data from the desk. And our goal and start, and you're going to hear me, I'm going to repeat this one over and over. Our goal starting from the day in order to come up with the data structure, the specific structure, organize the data somehow in order to reduce the number of disk input out operation that we need to perform. Disk input out operation, that means you reduce access the data or fetch the data from the desk. Of course, we aren't going to perform this one, but I have tried to make it more efficient or less number of disk input out operation or minimize uh, the need in order to access the data from the disk once it didn't get be needed. Okay. So, the th I will start with the way I want to say, yeah, I need just to, in order to understand, that, understand this one further, because we talk about volatile and non-volatile, etc. We wanted to make the distinction between the volatile and non-volatile, I mean storage. Okay. So the way that we're going to think about the storage hierarchy of the computers is as such as following here. This, I think we jump to this one, it'll be easy to go over this one. So we'll focus in the desk-oriented database, again, keep it desk-oriented, okay? So anyway, at the top of the storage hierarchy, you're going to find what here at the top here? You're going to have the device that are close to the CPU. This is the fastest storage medium that we're going to have. And you know, it looks like if you assume that this is you, use your brain. So it's easy for you to access the data that stored in your memory with the CPU cache. If you try to grab, let's say, read the, let's say something or grab something, uh, let's say from the next room that you get, a, you, uh, the room that next to you. So you have to walk a little bit in order to access the data or to fetch this information. If you try to access the data, for example, if you assume that you are in the super, uh, in the computer science department, the IT. So in order to access anything in the lower level, or let's say outside the steward building, that means you have to walk long distance, so you spend long time until you reach the data that's stored or they reach the, that destination where your data can be located. If you try, for example, the IAT and you want to fetch your uh, computer science department and you want to fetch the data that is, say, in the uh, say, downtown of Chicago. So that means you're going to spend long time because you wanted to find go long distance until you reach the data that you're looking for, or the data that you wanted to fetch. If you have tried to fetch the data, for example, uh, in the Neverville city, so in this case from Chicago, so you have to go longer distance, you spend long time in order to access the data. In other words, to summarize that, okay, at the top of the storage hierarchy, we have the devices that are close to the CPU, so the access time will be fast. Okay, fast storage. But this it also has what is called the smallest and the most expensive storage. Okay, the CPU cache smaller, fast to access, but expensive. Okay, the DRAM, for example, is like a bit larger than has more uh, say storage capacity than the CPU cache, but slower compared to the uh, CPU cache. When you say slower, that means it's far away a little bit from the CPU, so there is a time in order to fetch the data back and forth. That's the one thing to think about. Of course, not the exact thing, but just something in order to help us to understand. At this top, we're going to talk, call this part the ball time. Okay? What does that mean in this case? That means in this case, if you disconnect the information, or if we, for example, if you pull the power from the machine, then the data can be lost here. So when you turn off your machine or start your computer, whatever is on the CPU and the DRAM can be gone here. Okay. The vault time, I mean, storage supports what is called the fast random access. 
So that means you're going to perform the random access. That means you can jump faster from any location to one memory location to another memory locations. So it's going to store a support a faster random access with the byte addressable location. So I'm going to use a byte addressable. You have a byte, and when the byte, you can specify what the address that you're looking for. So you can jump, assume that you have the address 00x, zero, zero, blah, blah, blah. Then one, two, three. So you can jump whatever byte that you want. So it can perform random access. Random access is key you can jump in any location in the memory uh, in order to achieve the data that you're looking for. <laughs> okay. We also refer to the storage or this storage of class as a memory. So when you hear me talk about the memory, I mean anything here. Okay. Of course, you have a CPU register, so maybe it's the fastest one, the closest the CPU itself, inside the CPU or the CPU cache or DRAM, we call this one memory. Okay. The other part is called the non-volatile devices here. Okay, which is the further that you get away from the CPU, okay, it's gonna have what it's gonna I mean the larger part the slower the storage device get. If you get here the SSD, it's gonna be larger, but the slower compared to the DRAM and the CPU cache and CPU register. The hard disk is gonna be larger than SSD but slower. And the network storage, maybe you have a remote storage and network storage, that means it's gonna be like the larger but the slower than this HDDB or the hard disk as etc. But this part from SSD and HDDD was a hard disk or the network storage, all the non-volatile. Okay. So what does that mean in this case? That means the storage device doesn't need to be provide continuous power in order to say to for the device to retain the data that's stored there. So if you turn off the computer and turn on light, you're gonna find, we assume that there is no failure in the desk, okay? No one compromised the system, so the content that's stored in the second storage, uh, SSD and the HDD and network storage is gonna be available, gonna be available. There is no need to have continuous power or connected power in order to return the data to the store there, okay? It's uh, block page addressable, we call this one a block page addressable, so we're gonna use a unit as a block. Sometimes I'm gonna use block or page, I mean both of them, they have the same thing, okay? So in this case, when you try to retrieve the piece of information, any data, or any value, or any particular offset, you're gonna see this one later, we talk about the uh, the page so we store the data as a, a file, as a page, as a block into the file, or the, 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 in the desk. So anyway, the program is going to have, for example, I need the data from the, from the block 1, block 2, and the block th n, okay? Assume I want the data to store in the block 1. So I cannot access the, ex the exact data. I can ask the, I need to fit the entire block to the main memory. Then after that, well then that, I need to boss the data, I need to actually scan the blocks, entries, and to find, or counting, and to find the, block, the specific data that's stored in this block. So in this case, we call this one the block addressable, which is the way that acts the database on the block. You have to give me the block ID that you're looking for in order to fetch this one to the main memory. And just speaking, the size of the block is gonna be four kilobytes. I'm gonna talk about this one later in more details. When you talk about the block size, we're gonna use the four kilobytes. Actually, it depends on the database uh, management system gonna use, so most of them are gonna use a four kilobytes. So we try to make the size of the block that's gonna be used in the desk or we'll store the data in the desk similar to the size of the database page size. More details later, next lecture I guess, we we'll just start looking at the uh, storage uh, for, for how can we store the data onto the desk. So anyway, uh, this one is going to perform what's it called, I mean the uh, sequential access. What does that mean? When you say sequential access, the, we can't perform random access but the sequential access is going to be fast. So in order to try to fetch the data, so this one is going to be better at the sequential access when you use the non-volatile storage. So in this case, we're going to see, when we talk about in a few minutes, we talk about the hard disk as example, or the disk in general. You see the data is organized like in the cylinder, with the tracks, and within the track, you're going to have like sectors, and sectors are going to be organized, you say, uh, represent the say block. We try to access this block of the data here. 
when you read the first this block, you, you find yourself at the beginning of the next block. So the sequential that means you read this block, then after that you can continue reading the next block. Once you're done reading the next block, you can just read the third block, etc. There is no need in order to seek to find the next block because the next block is going to be uh, connected uh, or next stored next to the block that you just read. More details in a few slides when we talk about the sequential. I will talk about the disk, how it can be organized, and we're going to take a look at some optimization techniques which allow me in order to perform this approach. When you talk about the disk, by the way, we refer every anything here in normal time. I know there's a difference between SSD and HDD, but here we are not gonna make any major distinction between of them, okay? Because the structure I'm gonna see here with data is gonna be uh, treated as a block, and we're gonna have to access the data using normal time, etc. So it's okay if we uh, use or if we uh, uh, refer. To this part as a desk okay so that's what we cover here we talk about the the uh, the storage hierarchy here how it looks like in the memory and that's what they cover here with that's what we went over here more details so we talk about the voltage i mean uh, storage and non-voltage storage we do have another uh i think we do have like uh, a new class of storage device is called non-voltile memory, which is something combination for the voltile and non-voltile. You mix both of them. You try to take the best of both of them. Okay? I think some textbooks, I mean, it's not textbook, I see some papers who call this one persistent memory or non-voltile memory. Okay? You can read more about this part here. So anyway, this device is going to be designed to be the best of both worlds. Try to th take what's the best of voltage storage. That's when you turn off the power. Uh, sorry, it acts the data can be fast. What's the advantage using the non voltage storage? That means when you turn off the power, or when you say uh, there's no need uh, to provide continuous power in order for the device in order to return, let's say, the data that's it's stored. Okay, so it's going to be take the best of two. Here, if you take a look here, this one can be you can put this one in the middle. You can have a different color here, use red here. So, this is a non voltile here. You can be something in between here. So, anyway, so let's take a look. As you mentioned, we are gonna focus on the database and we're gonna this data will be stored on desk. Okay. So in this case, the data and the database files are going to be organized into pages. So the file is going to be organized in page and going to be in the file storage here. This is the structure how it looks like. It does, let's see, go over this one more details and get a help you here. Okay. So in this this is the desk, and uh, this here we're going to see later. We have the database files. It's going to be stored here. So here we have like one head, let's say one block. Inside the block, you're going to see we do have a header. We're going to talk about this one here later. Do you know that we have a second block? The size is going to be the same. Don't look at my uh, drawing, but it's going to be the same here. The data is going to be half a pages here, all the blocks. Then after that, if you're trying to add to fetch the data, you need to check whether they have a query or like execution. Uh, act engine instead, I'm looking for the pages, say, number one. So the system is gonna check it. The database system is gonna go to the buffer pool, okay? Which is gonna be in the memory here. In the buffer pool, and gonna say, okay, I'm try. Is the page one exist here or not? Assume the buffer pool can store only two blocks or two pages. Assume we do have like the page two and page three are stored here, <laughs> okay? Of course, we need to figure out since we have the data, or pages is going to be stored somewhere, either going to be in the main memory or the, I mean, on the, in the file or the desk. We need to have some data structure which is going to help me in order to figure out my way. How can we tell, or can we tell, uh, decide where uh, if we are, I'm looking for a specific page where the data is going to be stored in the desk? How can we access them? That's why here we're going to have a special data structure or this structure. We're going to use the directory or the base directory. We're going to cover this one more details later. And here 
we do have the item base directory, we must have a copy of the GMP available in the main memory, which is going to tell me where the data can be stored here, or can, how can I access the data here. Anyway, so once they did figure out to find the source of the buffer board, you tell the data does not exist. Now we need to figure out, you need to have the free space here, you need to evict one page here. We do have a replacement policy where they're going to tell me exactly which, let's say, page is like going to be a candidate in order to be a victim in order to for a vect, okay, in order to free space for the new block that we need to fetch. Assume going to be page three. I remove page three. If you want to require for me you to store this one back to the disk, you have to perform me because you made uh, made modification of the content of the base. Uh, then after that, now we're gonna fetch. I mean, say page one here. When the page one can be available in the memory, now I need to return for the address of page one to the uh, let's say execute engine. Engine then now starting perform the operation here. Okay. So that's, I mean, the, the basic idea of the uh, desk-oriented database management system. So at a higher level, okay, a high level design goal of the database management system is in order is going to do what? Is to support the databases that exceeds the amount of memory available. That what we like to do. If you take a look here, assume the memory you can require can fit only two blocks, and your data maybe you have one thousand blocks. So it looks like when you design my system, somehow I'm gonna give illusion to the user or anyone who used my system everything that you need is gonna be available in the main memory. That I'm going to try to do or do my best in order to perform this operation. Of course, we're gonna notice it depends on the replacement policy. It depends on the your way that in order to design or specify which block can get be or turn or stay or keep in the main memory here, in order to reduce what, in order to uh, uh, try to mitigate to try to reduce the number of disk and with our operation that you gotta before to get the data from the disk, because every disk and when you say you, I'm using disk and what output operation. That means every reading, writing operation from to the desk is expensive. This one, I'm gonna go over this one. Someone can say, how expensive? Because remember, when you try to access the data, the main memory, when you show you the memory hierarchy, as you see, it's so fast. But if you try to access the data that's located in the desk, now we get a spin long time. I mean, compared, if you try to access the data, uh, to proportion to the access data to the main memory, or the memory in general, that one can be expensive. That's why we try to reduce this kind of information here. And uh, again, since the reading writing to the desk is expensive, that means it must, these kind of operations must be managed carefully. And you try to reduce the number of discrete out operation as much as they can here. So we don't want what is called the largest star, okay, and performs degradation degradation of you, for example, from fetching something from the desk to the slow down everything else. Okay, so let's go over what do you mean by the read write operation here, because they are expensive. Reading this means when you try to transfer the data from the desk from the main memory. When you read from the desk to the main memory read operation. Okay? And when you try uh, and writing this means when you write a block of the data from the main memory and you want to store this one to the disk, both of them they are expensive. Okay? And compared relative to in memory operation. So again, it must be managed carefully. So let's go over the uh, desks. Okay? Since the data can be stored to the disk. Since I'm keeping saying the disk input out operation is expensive operation, so try to. I'm not going to convince you or give you an idea how expensive. How can you decide it's expensive or not? How can you measure that? Okay. So, what the desk here? Desk is a secondary storage device of a choice. Okay. We do have two different access types to the data. Either it's gonna be a random access or the sequential access. Random, that means you are here, I want to access data here, I want to access data there, and over there, and such. Okay, so read the data, let's say, uh, from anywhere at any time. 
For example, I want to block one, then I want to block 100, then I want to block two, then I want to block 17. So it's a random access to data, okay? The sequential read the data continuously, okay? So here we're gonna read the block one, read one block. Then after that, once you have done reading this block, you are going to read the next block. You see that? For the disk, you're gonna see that the disk oriented, or if you have a disk, you just speaking, we store the data on the disk. If I'm going to perform a sequential reading, that's gonna be perfect. Because you wanna go because this one gonna reduce the number of disk count operation or the time that you acquired in order to fetch the block. Okay, so just keep in your mind that we do have two different ways in order to access the data, the random acts and the sequential acts. And we prefer to use the sequential acts. I'm going to revisit this one in a few slides when we talk about the structure of the disk, how the data is going to be organized, then I'm going to revisit and talk about the sequential random acts. Hopefully, at the time, it's going to be more clear. Okay, so generally speaking, the data can be stored and retrieved in the unit using uh, called disk blocks or pages. So I'm not going to retrieve the data based on the bytes or the based on the uh, um, uh, address, specific address. No, I'm gonna retrieve the data as a block. So you ask one block, fetch one block, and store one block. Even if you need only one part of the block, I cannot give you a portion, uh, part of the block. I'm gonna give you the entire block or the entire page. We are going to use the block and page interchangeably. Both of them have the same meaning. Some text box is gonna enforce or try and emphasize or uh, use, I mean, the block uh, when the data can be stored in the desk and the page when the data can be resides at the main memory. But here I'm going to use both of them because they have the same meaning. You're going to have the same size, okay? Exact size, so it doesn't try to be used in the chart change. Anyway, so since, I mean, uh, the retrieval time depends upon the location of the desk. So if you um, find a way in order to organize the data next to each other, so in this case, you can perform sequential scan. Once you're done reading one, the first block, you can read, continue reading the second, read the third, read the fourth, and etc. That's why you said the retrieval time depends on the location of the data that's stored in the desk. Where, how you lay out your data on the desk. Okay, I will go over this one later. So we we claim here a relative replacement. Also, placement of base on the desk has a major impact on the database performance. I will go back later to this one. Let's go over the components of the desk. Just speaking, how the desk desk looks like or size. The desk, generally speaking, that contains or say multiple platters. So here, in this case, we have one, two, three platters. Okay, the platter is like circular hardware source, which allow you in order to store the data. Has the magnetic, including the magnetic changes, so you know that allow you have just a playable store zero on one. Okay, a platter is gonna rotate or spins, for example, specific number or rotation per minute. This one can keep spinning. That's what we hear. If you have a desktop or, or the computer has, let's say, a uh, disk as a second as a hard disk, you hear this one every time you try to access the data. It's gonna have make a noise like spin running. Fast. This is what it's called the, or the platter is going to be rotate in order to try to help you to fetch the data. Okay, we do have the what is called the rotation per minute, which is I mean the unit that you use in order to measure, measure I mean how fast of the velocity the platter is going to be rotate. Okay, usually you do have what's called the read write heads. So for every single platter, we do have two headers. We use this one as the read write. Why? Because generally speaking, for the platter, it's going to have two serves. One serves in the top and one serves in the bottom. Okay, so generally speaking, we have platters, multiple platters in the desk. For each platter, it's going to have two serves, okay? And in both serves, you can store your data. So for every single platter, it's going to have two heads, okay? One for the upper serves to read the data and write the data from the upper serves, and the second one in order to read and write the data in the lower serves, okay? Both of them, well, all these shadows are going to have the same R, so they're going to have moved together in or out. So this one is going to be moved together, okay, simultaneously. So this one, for example, is going to be in this position, that's mean all of them must be in the same position. So all this stuff is going to move back and forth, in and out, 
simultaneously at the same location. We don't have one hundred. We don't have this situation. For example, one hundred gonna be here, the other one is gonna be here, and the third one is gonna be here. No. So this one have a different location. No, both of them are gonna have the same. It's gonna move simultaneously at the same level, or together, in our art. Okay. Either we're gonna perform reading and writing. So gonna, we cannot read and write at the same time for the specific error. And this is the movement of this one. And this is the pass that's gonna take or move the date. Okay? Again, we have a platter. Each platter is gonna have a two source based on the description that we have. And each platter is gonna spin or move, has a velocity moving around. So fast spin, it depends, we call this one rotation per minute. And we do have like a set of headers for either is gonna be which allow us to know the derive the data from all the surfaces simultaneously at the same time, all the move at the same time, in or out. So first we good, yeah. Okay. So the surface of the plot divide into circular tracks. So if you take a look here, let's go over this one so it's really easy to understand what's going on. So the surface, this one surface, okay, with this one, the top surface, is divided into what's called, I mean, into circular tracks. So this is track, this is track, this is track, this is track. We have a number of tracks. Maybe we can add another track here. Okay? All of them have the tracks. And we do have maybe between 50 to 100,000, to say, tracks per plateau in the typical hard disk. Maybe the number will be changed more, but just, I mean, estimation. Anyway, so each track is going to divide into sectors. So this track is going to divide this one sector, this is another sector, this is the third sector, this is the fourth sector, this is the fifth sector, and etc. So we have like uh, surfs, each surf is going to be uh, divide into circular tracks, and each track is divided into, let's say, sectors, okay? And the sector is going to be separated from each other using a gap. So between this sector and this sector, this one sector, and this is another sector, we're going to have a gap here, okay? So like a space or space, uh, we cannot use this one in order to store any data. And used in order to identify the start of the sector. For example, if you have 10 sectors on each uh, track, that means you're gonna end up, we have, let's say, 10 gaps, because for each sector, we're gonna have add, like a gap, which is gonna help you to identify, this is the beginning of this sector, and etc. A sector has got a small scale that we can use in order to achieve the data, but it's not enough. Yeah, it's too small. So we usually, when you fetch the data, we're gonna use what is called, I mean, a block, or disk block, or the base. Okay, which usually compose of the number of sectors. So to simplify the process here, now to illustrate what I'm talking about, assume that the block has two sectors. So this is one block. And this is another block. In our example, this block one is composed of, let's say, two sectors. And the block two is gonna be two sectors. It must be have the same size, okay, for every single, a block that we have, two, three, four, uh, five, add, etc. So now when you try to achieve the data, we're gonna say, now we need to fetch one block, or two blocks, or three blocks, and etc. So I'm not gonna fetch sectors, I'm gonna use a block as a unit that you use, order. it's like a logical unit, used in order to achieve the data, or fetch the data. Okay? So every time I try to read the data or write the data, I'm gonna use a uh, reading or writing in, in the unit of a block. Okay? The size of the block is gonna be similar to the size of the base of the block in the main memory. So here when you fetch, remember we talk about the, we are going to organize the data as a sequence of blocks. Okay, we have a block one, block two, and etc. This in the desk. When you fetch this one to the main memory, we're gonna fetch this one into the buffer board. So we fetch this one into the page of the memory slot. We're gonna talk about this one later. We'll talk about the discuss the buffer board. Anyway, the size of the page or the block and the disk will then be similar to the size of the page of the block and the main memory. So here it's gonna help us in order to have an easy job in order to manipulate and manage the blocks. Uh, 
fits back and forth from the disk to the main memory. Okay. So that's what I've said. That's what I covered. The size will be 4K up to 64K. It's been the operating system. And most database management systems are going to use a 4K. And I'm going to cover this one more details when you have different. I think one database management is going to use 8, another one uses 16. So it depends what kind of database we're going to use. But roughly, summation, I mean, most of them are going to go over with 4 kilobytes. We do have another terminology, it's called the cylinder. Okay? So. Assume that the header is going to be at specific track, it, at specific cylinder. So since all the head is going to be uh, move in and out simultaneously as one unit, so all of them are going to be at the same distance from the beginning or from the center from this, let's say, platter of the surface, right? Because all of them are going to be the same place, at the same position. All of them, for example, at, uh, say, the track 5. So this one's going to be at the track 5, and this one's going to be at the track 5, you take a look at this one. So all the tracks at the same distance from the center, all the tracks that are end of the heads at the same time, in this case this track and this track, and this track, since we have two selves, we have one at the top, one at the bottom, and this track and this track, all of them is going to form a cylinder. So the cylinder defined as what? If you have the cylinder eyes, we can say this cylinder consists of the eye track of all the platters that we have. Okay? Make sense? Clear? Kind of. Okay. So let's say I have some characteristics with the disk storage. If we do are asking about how many cylinders do we have? The number of cylinders depends on the number of tracks per service. If you have 10 tracks per the service, that means the header can move uh, toward the one, two, three, four, up to 10 tracks. And every, when you heard head is gonna be at specific track, it's gonna form one cylinder. So this cylinder is gonna all the tracks at this location. I use both because we do have two serves here. So the number of cylinders, you can compute this one as the following. You can just compute the number of track per source or per platter. Okay? If you have a 10 tracks, that means we have 10 cylinders. And usually we use this one from 0 up to cylinder 9 if you try to use it. We try to, I mean, uh, identify them. The number of tracks per cylinder. How many tracks do you have per cylinder here? It depends here. The number of tracks per cylinder, either it's going to be the number of heads, Remember here, if you take a look, how many tracks do we have in this cylinder here? It's going to have one, two, three, four, five, six. So it looks like the number of hits that we have. Or you can define this one as the following as what? At the number of plats, our platter, multiplied by two. Since we have one, two, three platters, and each platter, platter is going to have two sources, that means we're going to have two tracks. Yeah, those in this case, the number of tracks per cylinder will be two multiply three, so we end up we have six. I mean, tracks for the cylinder. We prefer to use the average number of sectors per track. Why I'm gonna use the average? I think it missed one part here. Yeah, so typical the numbers uh, we do have like sectors per track. There'll be five hundred to one thousand for the inner tracks and between 1,000 to 2,000 on the outer track. So remember, if you take a look here, so the inner track is gonna have less number of sectors here, and the outer track is gonna have more than number of sectors, okay? So in order to avoid that, any inconsistency, so we are going to use the average number of sectors. And you assume that every track is gonna have the average number of sectors, okay? Instead, we have, because you have difference here, the inner track is going to be less space on this area, so it's going to have like less number of tracks than the outer tracks. Here you see this one is the same, but actually it's not going to be the same here. Okay. So if you, have, you know the number of cylinders, and you know the number of tracks per cylinders, and also you know the average number of sectors per tracks, I know how many cylinders do you have, I know cylinders, I know how many tracks per cylinders do you have here, 
and they know how many or the average number of sectors per track and I know for example the size of each sector so you can compute the disk capacity of the size by multiply all these numbers so you end up you have what the disk capacity of the size of the disk okay any question Good. So now let's take a look to the access time. Now I'm going to show you the way that when you try to access or fetch a block from the desk, how could you compute the access time? Why it's expensive in other words? So I'm going to define the access time. The access time, for example, you are looking for a specific block. And the access time is going to be what? It's the time between the moment that you issue the command, you said, I want to read this block X, okay? And this block X is going to be available in the main memory. This is what is called the latency of the disk, or we call this one the access time. So again, you try to say, I want to block X. The, all the value of X, that's for the specific block. Anyway, if this one is not available in the disk, so we're going to perform the information. I need to issue the command. I need to fetch this block from the disk and they want to store this block in the main memory, then after that, I'm gonna return and say the address to the, let's say, the engine, uh, or the SQL injection of the database engine, or the, that one, or the query engine that we're going to execute the query. That's what we call the access, time or the latency of that task. I'm gonna show you how could you compute that. So remember, we do have two basic operations. The first one, reading the data, which is going to transfer the data from the desk to the buffer. Also, reading, that means you're going to take, uh, let's say, from the desk to the buffer. Read. And we do have a write operation. That means we take the block, one well, block, I mean, from the buffer to the desk. This is the write operation. Okay? In order to read the data from the desk, remember, the data... Yeah, we are going to read a specific block. And you do have, you know, the structure of the data, yeah? or I mean, the, the architecture of the disk, it's how it looks like. Let's assume that this is, for example, we have many tracks, okay? Then you need to fetch or read this block. That's what I want to do here. So how could you read the data or the disk block? Here? First, in order to read the disk or block from the disk, require the disk in order to start spinning. So the disk is going to start running or start spinning, start rotating. And remember, i give you an example. We've said the, the bladder rotates between, for example, 7,200 up to 15,000 uh, rotations per minute. Okay, how many rotations going to spend per minute? It's going to be 700, uh, 72, I mean, 7,200 up to 15,000. Okay, this is, I mean, the estimation, the number that between in this range. <laughs> So first you have to spend, the that is going to start spending, which is going to be moving faster. Then the disk arms that are going to contain the read-write block, or the head, okay, used to read the read-write, must be moved to the correct track. So assume that the data is going to be in this track, so the head, read-write header must be moved here. Okay? In the right track. So remember, this one is going to be moved to the right track. Okay? Then... The disk head must wait until the right location of the track is found. So it depends if you are lucky or not, okay? So I need to read this one. So I'm going to wait until this one is going to be spent and going to be here. So this while, of this beginning here, and going to be stored here, okay? Once this one is starting here, so you see this operation, first this one must be spent. Second, you need to move the uh, disk arm, move to the right, uh, let's say, uh, track. Then after that, we're going to wait until the beginning of the block that I wanted to read is going to be under the read or under the head. Because this one is going to be spent. Then after that now, you are going to do what? Since the data is going to be spent here, the disk block can be read or can be read from the disk and copy to the memory. This one is going to be moved here under the this uh, head and starting reading the operation. 
You see that there's many operations you need to perform. That's why it's expensive. Let's show you exactly how can we compute the axis to this block. So we have this formula. This is very important. So this formula is going to help me know that to compute the axis time. With that time until I request, I need a specific block, and to this block is going to be available in the main number. Okay, so this composes the seek time, rotational delay, transfer time, and we have another delay. So let's first talk about the other delay. The other delay that the CPU time that in order to issue the input output operation, because you have input out request, you need to perform this operation. So the CPU you going to spend some time in order to issue this uh, command. The contention for the controller, because if you know the computer architecture, you know that there is a passes, etc. So in order to send the data back and forth from the memory to the desk, etc., you're going to pass this data to the, let's say, the passes, okay, in the computer. So it might be there's different programs which can be used in this desk right now, and also there is uh, different programs can transfer the data right now. So I'm on, not the only one that try to access the data. Either fetch data from the desk, or maybe someone I'm gonna the, the bus is gonna be busy or contingent. There's another program uh, transferring the data. Those delays are negligible. Okay, we compared to the seek time, rotational delay, and transfer time, we can assume that all the time that are delays almost to zero, because mainly the X time is gonna be dominated by the seek time and the rotational delay. <laughs> Okay, so let's go over this one. Actually, when you talk about this operation, when you read the desk, I talk or spoke about the seek time, rotation delay, delay, sorry, and the transfer time, which got to uh, summarize the steps that we follow here in order to read the desk block. So let's start first. How can you compute? What do you mean the seek time here? The seek time is what? Is the time in order to move the arm to the position disk head on the right track. Remember, we've said we have this track here. To assume this is the right track. This is, the, of course, the head read right away. I'm gonna move to the right track here. Then after that, this is what is called the seek time. Okay, the time that I need to perform or spend in order to just move the head at the, into the right position, or to the position the head, uh, disk head on the right track, okay? Or you can say at the proper cylinder, all them will be the seek time. It can be easy, uh, sorry, zero, if when uh, there's no need in order to move the header, okay, at the disk head, because it's already on the right track. This is a chance, there's a chance, yeah? there's no need to read this one or move this one because it's already in the right track, okay? It's, if not, then the head is going to be what? Required some minimum time in order to start moving. It's all mechanical operation, okay? So it's, it's like a motor. It's going to be ignited. This one in order to start. Now I need to start moving. So I need to spend some time. Minimum time. Then after that, I need time in order to stop. Because you cannot say jump. This is the location stop. We need time to start moving and time to stop. Minimum time, okay? And... Maybe we need, let's say, additional time in order to reach the distance that you want to cover. For example, right now, this is my head in this location. And I need to move this one to this right location. So minimum time to start moving and minimum time in order to start to, say, move to the right track. Here. And the minimum time in order to stop. Okay? You can hear me, yeah? Because I see, like, my screen is flicker. I think we are back here. Good. So in this case, I'm going to use the average seek time, which is going to be used in order to characterize the speed of the desk. Okay? So I'm not going to use the seek time. I'm going to use the average seek time, which the time is going to be spent in order to, in order to move from one track or in order to position the disk head on the right track. Okay? That's the seek time. We're done for this one. We do have the axis. Uh, our rotational delay. I done for the seek time. Now that my head is going to be in the right position. Okay. Now we need to perform the rotational delay. 
What does that mean in this case? Remember, we said the span of the uh, yeah, the bladder is gonna start moving, okay? Start rotating here. So the rotational delay is the time in order to wait for the sector in order to rotate under the desk cat. So right now, for example, assume this is the sector that you're looking for. Now the seek time, I'm in the right place. I'll just say this is the head here. And this is the block that I wanted to eat. So we need to rotational delay the time that is spent until the beginning of the block is gonna be here under the head to start or this cat in order to start the writing. Wait for the beginning of the block. Okay. So here we do have like uh, two different times. If you are lucky, or in average, it's gonna be the time or the desired sector or the beginning of the block that you want to read. It's gonna be in average, okay? It's gonna be about halfway around the circle when the head arrives at its cylinder. Let's to go over this one more details. These two scenarios here. Either it's gonna be like a lucky when you move the head in the sector, you're gonna reach find out you're gonna be at the beginning of the block that you wanted to eat. So the rotational delay in this case is gonna be zero. Or maybe when you move your head in the right location, at the top of the sector, you just miss I mean the block. So in this case, we have to perform one entire rotation in order to have or put the block at the beginning of the sector, uh, beginning of the sector of the block that you wanted to eat at the read height. So I'm gonna use the average case, the zero plus one divided by two, so I'm gonna use in half, in the average. Okay, the average rotational delay can be computed. Yeah, by the way, I think I don't have cold, I don't have the flu, I'm allergic. I've checked the pollen outside, it was a tree, is high. I hate the trees, okay? I, I'm allergic to the trees. So I'm supposed to stay at home for a couple of days in order to get rid of this sneezing. So this is good news. It's not flu, it's not cold, it's just allergic. That means I need to move from Chicago. Yeah, that's good news, but the problem is gonna, gonna last it for a couple of days, okay? And the sneezing, the best solution for me to move to Texas or maybe move to Nevada where there's no trees over there. I hate that. Anyway, so how can you compute the average rotational delay? So I'm gonna show you the way how to perform this example, how to perform this operation because it's very important because sometimes maybe you need to compute the average rotational delay. So given a total revolution, for example, 7,200 rotation per minute, and you need to compute the average rotational delay. Let me move to the uh, whiteboard, okay. So in this case, so assume that I give you like 72,000 rotational bear minutes. First, in order to compute the average rotational delay, you need to perform the following. One, you need to convert that rotational bear minute to the rotational bear seconds. Second. So in this case, I'm going to take 60 divided by 7200. This one step. Then in this case, equal is say halfly. Uh, sorry, yeah, it's funny. 7200 divided by 60 is equal 120. Rotation per second. All right? Then I need to perform what? I need to. Uh, I mean, the compute the delay, which in this case is going to be the inverse of the value of the velocity. So the, the delay that you need to compute here equal 1 over the value that we have, 20, or with equivalent 60 divided by 7200. That's why I wrote 60 divided by 7200. Okay? Then after that, remember, we need the average delay. Because remember, the average delay is going to be in the best case scenario. You're gonna need you are on the right track at the beginning of the uh, block that you want to read, or at the worst case scenario, you just passed it, you just missed it. So you have to perform another rotation. So we need to compute the average. So compute the average, let's see, three here. Average delay. So in this case, 
I'm gonna perform that say let's go with this one gonna be equal just to simplify the process second so I average it gonna be 0 0.0083 divided by 2 okay that's what kind of have and you need to make sure that since all the they say the value for the seek times the transfer time all of them have the same units we're gonna use the millisecond so we need to convert to the let's say to the millisecond okay so in order to convert this one from the second to the millisecond you need to multiply by 1000 okay so in this case you're gonna have 83 let's say 8.33 divided by 2 millisecond which is what is called the average to say that you wanted to compute average rotational delay so again take whatever the value that we have here and you just convert from the minute to the second. This is the simple way in order to perform the operation. Actually, you can't do this one in one line. I mean, in one operation, one command. Then, it, from the second, then after that, compute the delay, which is going to be one over the velocity that you compute here in the second. Divide these numbers. Then after that, you need to compute. Remember, we need to have the average delay. That means whatever the delay that we computed, you need to divide this one by two. Then after that, just to, in order to make sure that we have the same units that you use for the seek time and the transfer time, so the rotation of delay is going to be in the millisecond because all the seek time and the transfer time is going to be most of the time in the millisecond. So just to multiply this one with 1,000, and this is the value that end up, this is what is called, I mean, the average rotation of delay that I need to perform. Sometimes you require in the question, the exam, you need to compute that. <laughs> Sometimes I'm going to give you the average rotational delay, and sometimes I'm not going to give you the average rotational delay. So I will give you that rotational or rota rotation per minute in order to ask you to, in order to compute the, uh, I mean, the average rotational delay. Okay? Back to the slide. I guess we are in this slide here. Yeah? That's why. Yeah. So that's what we did here. One rotation, 60 by 70 to 100, this is delay. And you need to divide this one by two, then after that multiply 1,000 in order to make sure that's here, it's gonna be in the millisecond. Okay? Good. So now in order to access the test, we take off the seek time, let's move the head to the right track, wait until the beginning of the block and gonna be end of the head. Now I need to start to transfer the data or move the data or reading the data. Okay, I'm going to introduce you to the uh, go over first with the data transfer rate. Transfer rate, generally speaking, the number of pets is going to be transferred per second. That's the definition when we cover this one in the computer networks. Okay, or in other words, the rate which the data can be retrieved from the stored or stored actually, it can be read or write to the desk. So the transfer time is defined as the following. is the time that it takes, I mean, the sector of the block and any gaps in between them to rotate past the head. So here in this case, I put my data in the seek time at the specific or the right to say track. Then after that, a rotational delay, I'm waiting until the beginning of the block is going to be here. Under this, let's say, uh, the head. Now, that you see, the transfer time is the time that this this block is gonna be pass or go below the uh, or rotate uh, the uh, below the head or past the head. So it looks like when you move the data here, the block, all the sectors. Of course, we have, for example, three sectors. Each of them is gonna have like once the uh, two. We do have three gaps. So all this block of this area when the sectors of the block and any gaps between of them gonna be rotate past the head, it's gonna spend some time, which is gonna call the transfer time. In other words, the time that I'm gonna spend in order to read the data or write the data to the desk. We can compute this one using the following. If you try to compute the transfer time, and here the transfer time that you need to compute, if I don't give you the transfer time in the question, so you need to use the size of the data that you need to read, which in this case one block size, how many sectors, and the size of each sector. 
divided by the transfer rate, it's going to give you, for example, the time you spend in order to read, or there's going to be the uh, sector of the plot can be rotate past time in the head. Okay? So we managed to compute the seek time, we managed to we compute the rotational delay, and we managed also to compute the transfer time. We put all them together and we end up we have the access time. So hopefully now, let's summarize this one here. So first, the steps in order to access the data on the desk, move the disk head in order to the desired cylinder or the, let's say, the sector that you want to start reading the data to. So that's what is called the seek time. Generally speaking, between zero up to 10 milliseconds. This is, the, I mean, the time that you have. Zero, if there is no need, maybe you are lucky. You are, you're, you're right, your head is going to be right at the specific cylinder or the right cylinder or the right track that you want us to read the data from. Uh, uh, the extreme case that means we get a hold of maybe you, I mean, you have to pass, you are at the beginning or the end of the cylinders, of the last cylinders, and you need to move either to the first cylinder or you want to move to the last cylinder. So you have to spend the up to 10 milliseconds in this case. Then the second step here, you're going to perform here, you start waiting until the block, it's going to be the start, the beginning of the desired sector of the block, and going to be move or rotate until the head, which is called the rotational delay, which is going to be between zero up to 10 milliseconds. Then the third step, now we started transferring the data, reading the data, I mean, from the block to the main memory. So in this case, it's going to be less than one microsecond, uh, sorry, millisecond. So it looks like here, the seek time and the rotational delay is dominated the uh, access time, right? Because both of them are going to be between 0 up to 10 uh, milliseconds, and the transfer time is going to be less than milliseconds. So the key in order to try to lower the disk input out operation cost, in order we try to focus in the way that allow me in order to reduce the seek time and the rotational delay. Because as you mentioned, as you saw that, as you noticed that, both of them, they dominated, I mean, the access time. So now hopefully you are convinced that when you say the number, of, I mean, the disk comes out operation, expensive operation, because it gets involved like some mechanical operation. You need to move, for example, to a specific location, then you need to rotate, then after that you need to write the blocks that you're looking for. Of course it's fast, but compared to proportion of the data, or try to access the data in the memory, you see that that is expensive. Okay? Okay. So, remember we have said the way that or uh, arrange uh, your data in the desk is gonna has an effect over the overall performance. So, right now, I'm just talking about one block X. I'm looking for a specific block. So how about the next block? So it, I've read, for example, I need a block one, a block two, or one, block one, a block 15. So now we're done from the block one. You identify the beginning of the block one, you move the head of the right uh, sector of the uh, track, then you rotate uh, until the, the block, or the beginning of the block is gonna be uh, below the head. Then after that, you read the data, or transfer the data. Now I'm done from the first one. So now I'm looking for how can we read the more efficient way in order to read the next block. So, Blocks and files should be arranged sequentially on the desk by next, we we'll say this one, to minimize the seek and rotational delay. Remember, we've said the seek and rotational delay are the main problem here that we have. So try to organize them, I mean, minimize them. So how about this? Assume that this is one sector here, okay? I'm gonna have a block one. Then after done, I'm gonna have a block two. Next to the block one, then after that, I'm going to have a block three. Then after that, you block four, block five. Assume that we have block six. As of course, all of them are going to have the same size. size. Okay? And now assume that I wanted to read to say block one. So assume that, oh, let's say I want to block one, two, three, four. I actually is supposed to have block one here. So this one blocks two, two three, four. Five, six, because I don't want it to change my diagram. So first we need to move to say the head to the right track. Okay, this is the seek time. 
Then after that, now I need to rotation delay. I need to just, I mean, wait until the beginning of the block that start I want to read. I'm going to be under the head. Now I'm going to perform transfer time. So you have one seek time, one rotation and delay, right? Now we're going to perform what's called the uh, transfer time. Transfer time, I'm going to do what? I'm going to read, uh, read, uh, read, I mean, or read, I'm going to read the first block. Once you've done the first block, this one, let me write this one different color here. So assume we move this one. Now the first block is done here, right? So it looks like we have, you say, this way here. We're going to have here a block one is going to be here, and the block two is going to be here, and the block three is going to be here. We start because move to the next one because this one is going to be rotate. And this is block four. And this is block five, okay. And this one is gonna be at the beginning of this one. Here, for example, block six, or maybe it's gonna be next block. Assume that I want to block one. Then after that, I want to block six and etc. So once you're done reading this transfer one block that you're looking for, you fi find yourself that you're already at the beginning of the next block that you wanted to read. So in this case, the way that organize my data is gonna help me in order to eliminate or reduce the seek time and rotation and delay. So when organize my data in sequentially, yeah, maybe this one, I made this one mistake. I assume you have block one. Let me write this one here again. It doesn't chart. So block one here. Then after that, block two. Then after that, block three. Assume only three blocks, okay? That's what I have here. And this is my sectors. So when you really, ah, I hate myself. Of course, I don't hate myself. Not a lot. Okay, and this is my header here. It's gonna at the beginning here. Um, I perform seek time. I perform rotation delay. Now I'm gonna read the first block. I done from this block. So when you read the first block, you perform the transfer time. Now the first block is gonna be here. All right. Now, instead of block one, we do have a block two because this one is going to be more rotate here. And instead, we have block two, it's going to be block three here. And here, we don't have nothing. Now, I'm done with transfer the block one to the next block since the data is uh, in, uh, stored in this sequential or next to each other. I don't need to perform seek time or rotation or delay in order to read the second block because the seek time is going to be zero because I'm the right track and the rotation or delay is going to be zero because. I mean the head. I mean the beginning of the block is gonna be in end of the head that I'm gonna to use to read the data or this cat. So I'm gonna read the block two. Once I'm done reading block two, so this block one here, this block two here, and this is gonna be block three, and this one gonna be nothing here. I'm gonna be able to read the block three and etc. So you see that we eliminate or reduce the seek time and the rotation delay by only controlling the way that organize your data. In the way that uh, by uh, store the data sequential. Okay, so lay out the data sequential gonna help me in order to minimize the disk on but other ways you're gonna perform here. So the best way in order to next block concept, a blocks gonna be stored in the same track. Once the same track is gonna be done, now start the next block is gonna be what? In the same cylinder. So the track here, assume this is track, assume that I'm gonna have. This is cylinder, okay? So I store this data here, next to each other here. And this track, once this, this serve is done, I'm gonna store it in the next serve in the platter. I'm gonna stay in the same track, then store the next pair, platter. Then after that, store the next serve. So now when you perform, you are going to perform only one seek time and only one rotation delay. Then you start just to perform transfer data. Once you're done for this operation, you read all the blocks in this serve, What's going to happen here? You're going to find yourself at the beginning of the next block. Why? Because I'm going to start to read the data from the other serves. Okay? The, here, the bottom. Once you read the entire data here, now you do need to move. You do need to perform seek time or rotation delay because you are going to be able to read the data from the next platforms here, with the data that is stored here. Once you've done this one, you're going to read the next data from the, from the uh, other serves. Once you're done to read the data from the cylinder, now you're going to store the data for the, uh, to the next cylinder. Okay, I'm going to use a different color if you need more space. This is the best way in order to organize the data. And the next cylinder, add it. 
So that's the way how can you perform, uh, I mean, arrange the data sequential. Of course, we're going to see this one in order to keep your data in sequential order or sorted somehow, uh, required from you to do maybe extra job or extra work in order to, because the data is not static, because you keep modifying the change, modif uh, deleting data. So sometimes maybe you're going to use the space that can be free from one block using the data that's the, that belongs to the other relation. <laughs> Okay, for the sequential scan, we do have what is called the prefetching, because now you know that we're gonna read the block one, then after that we're gonna read the next block, which gonna be stored next to it, each other. So one way to do this one, I'm gonna fetch block one, and I know the system. We're gonna see that later. The database management system is smart enough in order to decide, in order to tell, oh, it looks like this guy is gonna perform sequential scan, sequential access the data. So we are going to store or access the entire data that belongs to this relation. So I know now you fetch block one, block two. So in advance, I'm gonna fetch block three and block four if I have a time, without asking, without your asking. So now in the uh, let's say the uh, query engine or uh, Looking for a specific page or the page number three or four, there is no need to fetch this one because the base is already available in the main memory because the system prefetched them. We're going to talk about this one later in more details, but keep in your mind the question scan, the prefetching is going to allow us and help us uh, in order to reduce or minimize keeping saying that the seek time and the rotation and delay. Okay. So if you do everything right, follow guys, you have a double buffer, maybe you have data, you can have double buffer in order to store the data, so you can fetch two blocks at a time. You have a staggered block, so the blocks can be stored next to each other in sequential order, or sequentially action. So the time in order to get the block should be proportional to the size of the block only. I'm just focused in the transfer rate in this case. I'm talking about the next block, yeah? So that depends on the size, block size, divided by the transfer rate, plus some ne negligible, let's say, time. Why? Why do you, what do you mean the negligible here? Maybe you need to skip gap. Maybe you need to switch track to the next track from the top of the next. Maybe you need, in some on the wide, you need to have the like, next cylinder, because you're down reading with the data from this cylinder, and you need to jump to the data that's stored in the next cylinder, if you follow the technique that we talk about here, the next block concept. Okay, which is this one. So now we take a look at the way how can you compute the access time. And we hopefully we convince that it's expensive because you need to perform some mechanical operations. We need to do some seek time, we need some rotational delay. Then after that, we need to transfer the data. The way the data that organized in the desk, layout the desk, if you have a sequential, you store the data in sequential order or sequentially. That we have one block gonna be stored, to say, uh, blocks gonna be stored in the same track. Then after that, stored in the same cylinder. Then after that, the blocks in the on the adjacent cylinder, etc. So here we can eliminate the seek time and rotation and delay. You need to perform this one maybe one or two times seek time and rotation and delay. Then most of the time you're gonna perform the transfer time, which is gonna be like the less expensive operation, as you know, it's gonna be less than one millisecond. Yeah. So you see that we can. The way that lay out the data on the desk is going to help you a lot in order to reduce the number of disk elements are doing operation here. But there is no free cost. You're going to see later when you start storing the data, you need to keep in your mind you have to store the data in this order. So that's going to have some cost associated with this one. If you compare this one with the random storing the data or the st randomly store the data on the desk, I don't care. I'm not going to spend anything. Just the only thing you see. I'm looking for any blocks that have a space in order to store this data. Good luck. Where did it get be stored? Next to each other, uh, in uh, different locations, I don't care. It's going to be fast to store the data, but it's going to be slower in order to retrieve the data. For the sequential, uh, when you store the data sequentially, it's going to be, it may be slower once you start looking or store the data, but it's going to be faster when you try to accelerate the data here. <laughs> So, generally speaking, we write the data maybe less frequently, but we read the data more frequently, okay? So, it's going to have, I mean, uh, it's going to be okay later. So, as a rule of thumb here, we do have the random input out operation expensive, and the sequential input out operations are much less expensive. 
what do you mean exactly here? Let's take a look to the now the sequential axis pattern and the random axis pattern is clear to us. For example, in the sequential axis pattern, that means now we start the data into sequential. So that means successive requests are for the success. For you say disk blocks. For example, you store the data block one, then after that block two, then after that block three. And you said I want to access block one, two, three. So you need just to perform one seek time in order to beginning this uh, first block, then after a rotation delay, then after that, the only thing you need to perform transfer of time, uh, time plus transfer of time plus transfer of time. Of course, at the beginning, we'll locate the beginning of the first block, we are going to perform the complete access time, seek time, plus rotation and delay. So in this case, you're going to be, let's say, the, what's the access time to access this data in this sequential uh, access pattern? The access time, is equal to the seek time, the blast is say rotational delay, plus if you notice someone screaming, this is my kids, okay? They said, that, I mean, my wife tried to keep them quiet since morning, but now I think they are out of control. So it's like background music, okay? Anyway. So the, the, uh, the rotation delay, plus here we have transfer time. The transfer time is going to be what, how many blocks we have, the block sizes, divided by, let's say, the transfer, transfer rate. Or, let's say, 3 multiply the time to, to, say, to transfer one block. So there's no need to have the seek time and rotation delay. So just only you need to, you need to press the block. For the random access pattern, there's a different story here. So in this case, maybe if you take a look, you know the data how to organize in the desk, right? So maybe you're gonna have this case. I need to access the block that's stored here. Then now I need to access the block stored here. Then now I need to access the block. You see that it's gonna be anywhere. The data is not organized. This is the worst day in my life. Anyway. So here we have six, six, I mean requests for the blocks. Thank you. I'm sneezing the whole day long, but I don't know what I have to do. Anyway, so we have successive I mean requests for the blocks that can be anywhere on the desk. Come on, I'm not gonna end the lecture. I'm gonna continue the lecture. Still have time. Anyway, so here you see that we have successive requests. It's gonna be for blocks that can't be anywhere on the desk. No, not the third time. Okay, that's all, okay? I have to stop the lecture. Okay, so next lecture, I'm gonna continue talk about the sequential access pattern and the random access pattern here. Then after that, see what the cost of the writing. Then after that, in order to modify the block, then just to give you an example, how can we compute the access time? And we give you like some uh, characteristics, some disk can have some characteristics over this one, okay? Thank you guys, I really apologize. Yeah, this is all for today. Okay, don't forget, I'm going to post. Today I will try to do this one. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, send you an email, just a reminder that the coding assignment one is available online, so you can take a look to the description. At the same time, I'm gonna send you the link maybe tomorrow, that allow you in order to start forming the groups, okay? So start early. Thank you guys, and see you Thursday.